thanks uh, to all of you for being here. We launched Paya in this room four years ago. Uh, when we launched our, the second phase in 2020, we did it in like, you know, our teeny tiny small boxes on Zoom. And it is a lot nicer to be delivering remarks to you and not my dog. <laughs> Although she's an easy, maybe an easier audience, I don't know. Um, so some of, so many of you were in the room when we launched here four years ago, um, but there are even more new faces among us now, both in this room and in the over 150 people who registered to join us virtually. So throughout the day, if you see us sort of market, remarking to the camera or doing things up here that seem odd, no, some of that's for the webcast. Um, but having so many new faces in this room, having so many people online um, is a sign, as Mary Alice remarked last night, that this community has grown in size tremendously since it launched in 2018. For anyone who's joining for the first time, welcome. Um, we are, we'll introduce ourselves again because we always do it just so folks know what they're getting themselves into, but we're a national initiative here at New America, multi-partner, multi-year initiative uh, dedicated to advancing youth apprenticeship as a strategy for restoring the link between uh, American education and economic mobility. Four years old this fall, PIA is a collaboration of national partner organizations and philanthropic supporters who work together to build this field and increasingly to empower you all to lead it. Many of uh, our partners and funders are in the room today, and in case I run out of time at the end here, which I'm famous for doing, um, let me make sure that I say it to you all loud and clear, once and for all, we would not be here on stage today in a room full of people without your partnership, your leadership, and your friendship. Thank you. Oh yeah, and I have these, don't I? Forgot about this. Uh, all right, so over the past four years, we've had the privilege of working in communities and regions across the United States uh, where dynamic public and private partnerships are working to build youth apprenticeship in a wide range of injury, injury, industries. These programs provide on-ramps into jobs and careers in IT, in cybersecurity, in healthcare, advanced manufacturing, financial services, the, the skilled trades, education, and more. And in a second, we're going to tell you just how many of these occupational pathways we've seen seeded over the last four years. It's pretty incredible. Through the work of all of the people represented by dots on this screen, we see growing evidence that youth apprenticeship can provide positive outcomes for employers, for students, and, and communities. Ultimately, PIA's goal is to expand high-quality youth apprenticeship so it becomes an accessible, equitable, mainstream post-secondary option for American high school students. As we work towards this vision, PIA uh, advances three core objectives. We work to support place-based partnerships uh, that increase the number of youth apprenticeship opportunities available across the country that are aligned to PIA's definition for high-quality youth apprenticeship and the principles that we developed collaboratively as part of our first phase of work. We work through our network and the relationships that Anne-Marie referenced to facilitate learning and innovation in the field and to support the wide-scale adoption of best practices and enabling policies across the nation. And we work with all of you to tell stories, to collect data, to build evidence, to strengthen the case and the evidence base for youth apprenticeship, to raise awareness of its potential, and to mobilize policy, action, and investment to really change the narrative about the options that are and should be available to young people today. Our first launch phase, uh, whoops, our first launch phase ran from fall of 2018 to fall of 2020 and focused on establishing norms and foundational resources to lay a foundation for what was back then a small and disconnected and nascent field. Honestly, we, we didn't really know what to expect when we launched. Uh, we, we knew that we had sort of a core community of excited people, but we could never have predicted the initial interest we saw in the uh, first round of grants that we made. We had an office pool going. I think the high guess was 42 applications. Uh, we were refreshing all morning on the day they were due, and we ended up with over 230 applications from 49 states in Puerto Rico. Unfortunately, we couldn't work with everybody, uh, but we had a, a tremendous group of nine uh, partnerships that we funded in that first year of work. Uh, many of them are with us today, and the overwhelming uh, demand from the field led us to establish the PIA network, which was not secret for you all here. It was not part of our original strategy, but it has proven itself to be a remarkably useful, durable, um, and impactful uh, part of the work. 
In the second phase of our work, uh, we really we launched in the middle of the pandemic, and we designed that really to maintain the momentum and accelerate the program development and design and implementation efforts that we had seeded in phase one. Uh, again, launching in the height of the pandemic, a tumultuous time for young people, for businesses, for our economy, for our communities, we really didn't know what to expect. We weren't sure if youth apprenticeship would survive the tumult of the pandemic. Would the partnerships that we had seeded and supported persist? But I think it's testament to the dedication and commitment of many of the people in the room and their partner organizations listening from home that the answer to both of those questions was a resounding yes. And today, um, I'm going to skip a slide here and go right to that one um, to, to share proof of these yeses to, to many of you. So on this prior slide you saw, there's a, a map with lots of tiny little dots. There's some bigger dots here. Uh, the prior slide was the PIA network. Anne-Marie mentioned this. We have 49 place-based sites that participate in this virtual learning community we've established. Uh, and I actually think if we were to truly survey who's attended a lot of those events, it would be almost double that. Uh, these dots represent uh, the PIA grantees. And we've had the opportunity to work very closely uh, with the sites indicated by these green. The light green, lighter green, lighter teal dots there are our first round of green teas. Uh, there are nine of them. The darker green are six that we supported uh, most recently over the last year and a half with seed funding to develop strategies to launch new programs. Uh, and the purple represent our PIA National Learning Hubs, which are two outstanding, well-established programs, CareerWise Colorado and the Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeships Program that we have seed, uh, funded in the last several years to provide mentorship, resources, and really to drive a learning agenda with us for the field. We have collected data now, twice from some of these folks, once from some of these folks. Uh, and in just a second, I want to share some of what we're seeing. I will say uh, we have not included data from our two purple folks on this. Uh, and there are lots of reasons for that. But they're just not in here in the numbers that you'll see in a second. We'll fold them in later this year when we pull data from them again. All right, so in 20, fall 2020, the close of phase one, uh, our green tees, we had seven that were in a position to provide programmatic data. A, a couple of them were really still developing and launching programs. We had 20 occupational pathways across that cohort. We had 112 employers who had put their hands up, were hiring or would soon hire uh, appre youth apprentices through the program. And we had 687 young people who had enrolled and were participating. Some of these programs were still in the process of really establishing uh, uh, the sort of programmatic elements that we would want to see in a youth apprenticeship. But they had committed themselves to the principles and were moving fast in the direction of implementation. In just two years' time, we have been able to collect data from six more of these sites, which means they're enrolling partnership or enrolling young people. They have more part, uh, the employers on board, and they've developed programs um, and occupational pathways, expanding the range of options available to young people. And you know, we haven't calculated the rate of growth here, but given that many of these programs launched and recruited employers and young people in the, the pandemic, we think this is worthy of celebration. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so folks often say to us, well, and, and Marie referenced this, youth apprenticeship, what do you do in youth apprenticeship? We've been really excited to see growth in a number of different occupations in our cohort. Manufacturing and advanced manufacturing is the most popular in, in the um, cohort, in, across the cohorts overall, but we also see a lot of growth in fields like information te and technology, construction and the skilled trades, where youth apprenticeship has not really made significant inroads um, for a host of, of reasons, healthcare, and early in K-12 education, which has gained a ton of steam and is consistently ranked as a top um, area of interest for the programs with which we work. We're also really proud to tell you that PIA grantees enroll a greater share of non-white apprentices than we see in the US registered apprenticeship system overall. Our par partners at JFF recently did a really um, very useful, very timely study of data of young adults in the registered apprenticeship system. And we see that PIA grantees are enrolling um, as, a, as a share of their enrollees, twice as many black students, um, more indigenous youth, more Asian youth, um, and more folks who identify with multiple races. I, I will say we have fewer um, Hispanic or Latino youth in the cohort overall, and that's something that we're curious to understand what's going on there. We also have um, a higher share of female apprentices enrolling at our PIA grantees. Uh, than we see in the US registered apprenticeship system overall. For reference, our friends at JFF found that over the last 10 years, uh, the, the share of young female apprentices, so apprentices in the registered apprenticeship system who are between the ages of 16 and 24, it's only about 7.1% female. So while this may not seem 
like, you know, it's the gender parity we would hope to see, there are signs that when well-designed programs are stood up, when intentional recruitment is de designed and delivered, we can make these programs more equitable, uh, and we can attract people into these pathways to provide the sort of structured, supported learning opportunities that we know can make a difference in young people's lives. Um, we also see some interesting patterns of, uh, um, oh, this is a slide I thought. So we know in the registered apprenticeship system overall and in our labor market, there's a significant gender segregation. And by this, we mean that women and men tend to be clustered in certain types of jobs and certain types of occupations. And to some extent, we see that persist. We certainly see it persist in the registered apprenticeship system overall. And we do see some of that in the PIA data. And it's something we're keeping our eye on. So female apprentices uh, in the PIA sites are overrepresented in fields like healthcare and education, just as they are in the labor market overall. Male apprentices are overrepresented in fields like manufacturing in the trades. Again, these mirror patterns that we see in the labor market, but what we'd really love to see is signs that uh, apprenticeship and youth apprenticeship can dismantle some of these patterns and, and shift the direction. And a bright spot, we do see near gender parity in the IT pathways and business and business operations pathways that our grantees are running. So that suggests an, an area where we, you know, we want to understand how is that working? How did they do it? What does it look like? Uh, and what lessons can we extract from the success in those spots and, br and bring to other areas? But despite some of the bright spots um, that we've seen through PIA over the past four years, we really can't mm -hmm. ignore uh, that the COVID-19 pandemic and the ensuing economic mobility uh, volatility uh, will continue to have a long-term effect on the economic trajectories of young people. Youth employment has returned to pre-pandemic levels, but significant gaps by race and gender persist. Enrollment in college remains 10% lower than it was before the pandemic, and the greatest declines continue to affect younger students, particularly Black and Latino men. Uh, while many of these young people are likely to return to some form of post-secondary education, a growing body of research indicates that delaying college enrollment may have significant long-term negative impacts on individuals' labor market outcomes over time. And frankly, with or without a college degree, a young adult today is less likely to earn as much as his or her parents have done in generations before. Basic necessities, housing, health care, education, child care, that were affordable to previous generations are far more expensive for young people today. And, and that was true even before this like inflation crisis that we hear about all day, every day, every time you turn the radio on. But all of this makes the transition that young people face when moving from when high school into adulthood, even harder to navigate. And many of the proven paths to make that transition, to proven paths of the past, are becoming less reliable for them, even as they become more costly. So I, I, we here at PIA are not naive enough to suggest to you that youth apprenticeship is going to solve all of those problems. We know that as promising a strategy is, it's not going to solve them all. But I think as many of the folks in this room and online, I suspect, um, can attest, apprenticeship is uniquely suited to meet the needs, the immediate needs of students transitioning out of high school who are, as many recent surveys have demonstrated, increasingly demanding education opportunities with stronger, more direct connections to the labor market. As we think about uh, launching our third phase, and we've said this, this is our fourth birthday party, so we're, we've had kind of two phases of two-year work, and we're excited to be looking ahead and, and launching today, sort of soft launching today, the next phase of our work. Um, but we do see that youth, apprentices, youth apprenticeship is experiencing growing interest in the field that's driven by a convergence of educational, economic, and social forces, and an uptick in both public and private investment in the model. This mounting momentum presents a rare opportunity for PIA to leverage and expand on the work that we've done these past few years to ensure that high standards, a commitment to equity, and a vision for long-term sustainability remain hallmarks of the youth apprenticeship landscape as it enters its next phase of growth. To date, the infrastructure that we have built for this field has enabled local, state, and national partnerships to develop, connect, collaborate, commiserate, <laughs> Uh, to, and more effectively under a shared vision for this field, one that is grounded in the PIA principles for high quality youth apprenticeship, which are printed and all over the back. If you want to take one with you later on, we've got lots of copies. But before anyone accuses uh, me or PIA of making this all sound easy, let me also say it clearly, it's anything but. The innovators in this room can also attest to that fact. If we've learned anything in the last four years, it's that building high quality youth apprenticeship programs and the relationships that undergird them can be slow, 
painstaking work, but it's happening and it's beginning to happen faster and faster and more efficiently around the country. And that means as a field we're approaching a, a pretty critical transition point. So ultimately PIA has always seen uh, youth apprenticeship as a strategy to really rethink how, we how our systems prepare young adults to succeed in adulthood. It's always been a core tenet of our vision. It's sometimes been hard to explain, but ultimately what we hope to see is youth apprenticeship driving the kind of systems change and systems alignment that can pay dividends not just for youth apprentices, but for young people across the country as systems become more efficient, more cooperative, uh, and, more, and better aligned. So earlier I walked through our objectives as an initiative, um, and you may not be surprised that they align with some of the categories that are up here on the slide. We work at the programmatic level to support place-based partnerships to increase the number of youth apprenticeship programs, to define and tell you what quality looks like, to help support the adoption of standards that make these programs deliver the outcomes we want to see. And we've also done a lot about how we change and flow, where information flows, how resources and information and tools, what that looks like. We also um, work at the structural level to really rethink uh, and redefine best practices to promote and test enabling policies across this growing field and to really understand what it's going to look like to drive the, the kind of innovation and long-term learning agenda that we will need to continue growing high-quality programs and ensure they're delivering the equitable outcomes we know they can. And finally, a lot of our work is looking, is thinking at this cultural level. What does it mean to build a case, build the evidence base, tell the story of youth apprenticeship and the organizations and young people that, that are, are, are witnessing and experiencing the power of these models to really change how we think about the way young people should enter adulthood, what the right choices are, what the good choices are, um, and how do we shift that narrative thinking? Many of the folks in this room, I think, would say youth apprenticeship sounds like a great idea, and they might, they might still think twice about their own kid. And we really need to, to change the narrative, not only to make these more of these high quality programs available to people, but also help people understand that there is more than one way forward in America for young people to achieve economic success, to find economic opportunity, and also to find passions and people and networks that will support them as they transition from being teenagers into this weird sort of liminal space of their 20s, and increasingly maybe also their 30s, but that's a conversation <laughs> for a totally other day. Um, so I'm running short on time and I know that I've been told I can't, I really can't go over today, but I'm, I'm going to just for a minute. <laughs> So we have spent uh, uh, an enormous amount of time in the first phase of our work really putting pressure on this programmatic stuff. We've been pushing hard. We've established standards, principles. We've developed tools. We've developed data frameworks. We've really tried to give the field what we think is needed to develop these programmatic proof points and start showing the world how these programs work, what they can be, and helping other people understand, oh, hey, I want to do that. And I think the growth in this room is at least some sign that that's working. But as we look to the next two years of PIA, we're really excited to have an opportunity to leverage that programmatic infrastructure that we've built to lead youth apprenticeship into its next chapter of growth. And so for us, as we think about what that means uh, looking forward, PIA is going to continue supporting program implementation and innovation, but we also want to start pushing even harder on some of these structural and cultural elements out here that you all have surfaced to us as the hardest things for you to tackle independently in your corners of the country. And so as we look ahead to phase three, I will own right now we're not about to lay out our 15-point plan for what comes next. Uh, but we know that the PIA network has proven to be a powerful vehicle for accelerating learning and building communities across the field of youth apprenticeship. We know that it can continue to be a critical resource for promoting scale while maintaining those standards of quality and equity. We know that telling the stories, developing the uh, evidence base, getting your data, and continuing to ask hard questions about why things are challenging for you, what it means to, to improve programs over time, how you solve some of those tricky challenges around liability and addressing occupational segregation and putting together braided and blended uh, business models so that you can really you know, achieve the sustainable goals that folks are telling you you must set. These are the kind of questions we want to continue pushing on that we're really excited to have the opportunity to learn alongside people in this room to put some of those questions together. There is a lot more to come from PIA, 
Um, we are really looking forward to continuing to expand uh, our, the partnerships with the national partners who we are going to name and thank in one second. Uh, we're really looking forward to continuing to support the work of our place-based grantees, and we are really looking forward to continuing to figure out just how powerful the network can be as a vehicle for learning and helping this field continue to sustain its, itself over time. But today, I'm going to get out of telling you about that whole work plan by reminding you that this is actually more of a celebration of what we've done. And so we want to pause today to recognize a lot of the folks in this room who've been working really hard. They've taught us a ton of stuff. They've done a lot of work. And for the last couple of years, they've mostly done it in front of computer screens. So in just a second, we're going to kick off our official program. But I want to say a couple of really important thank yous uh, in case that you don't get to hear us celebrate the work that they've done. Um, first, I want to make sure that we say in no uncertain terms that none of this work would have been possible without the support and expertise and network of our incredible national partner organizations who do research, who provide technical assistance, who provide sanity checks frequently <laughs> to make sure that we are on uh, that we're, and remain on the path that we've set for ourselves together. So these are Advanced CTE. Kate's here in the room today. Make sure you say hi. She'll be up on a panel later. CareerWise Colorado is in the room. Ryan and Jill. Um, Education Strategy couldn't be with us today, but they are a wonderful partner as well. Kathleen and Ryan and Matt continue to support all the work that we do. JFF is represented here today by Andrea Messing Matthew. Matthew, thank you for being here. National Alliance for Partnerships and Equity. Brittany will be on stage with us momentarily, but she is not getting mic'd. She's getting mic'd. Uh, and the National Governors Association, I have seen Jordan, and I think I've seen Rachel right there. Um, uh, thanks to you both for being here. And our folks from Trident Technical College, Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeships, I think Rob is in the back. Melissa couldn't be with us today. But thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Finally, none of what we could do Absolutely none of what we could do would be possible without the continued support and thought partnership of our funding partners. Uh, they have been with us. Many of these folks have been with us since before our launch four years ago. Uh, and we would really like to take a second just to recognize the folks from the Annie E. Casey Foundation, Bloomberg Philanthropies, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the J.P. Morgan Chase and Company, Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Foundation, the Siemens Foundation, the Smith Foundation, and Harbor Freight Tools for Schools Crew, um, and finally, the Walton Family Foundation for your continued ongoing support and the great, great questions that you are constantly asking us. Thank you. <laughs> and really quickly, if you'll permit me to do this, I just want to say a very quick thank you to our staff here at New America, our talented and tireless and tired tech uh, events and tech colleagues, Molly, Angela, Morell, Riley, Jason, and Shannon in the back. Thank you so, so, so much. Anne Marie and Paul for being here and supporting the work that we do. My colleagues in EPP and Selna, especially Mary Alice, Elena, Kevin is around here somewhere. The PIA team, I can't say enough. Mike, Kelly, Sarah, Fabio, who did these animations that I still can't quite figure out how to quick food, but they're amazing. And to all of these other folks across New America who make everything we do possible, Christine, Garrison, Shana, and the development team who help us pay the bills. You don't get named enough up here. I hope you're listening or someone tells you, but thank you, thank you, thank you. None of this work, like I said, would be possible without you all. So there is one more person who may or may not be here that I want to call out really quickly by name, both as a way to recognize her, but also to let me segue to the panel. One of many things I've learned here uh, it, through Paya is that this is a community of doers and fixers and problem solvers. So earlier this week, we had a little bit of a snafu with this panel. We had a couple of young people cancel, and I was lamenting this reality to uh, a colleague in the room. Is Latifa Durant here? All right, Miss Latifa Durant. <laughs> So Kelly, Kelly and I reached out to Latifa and she said, oh, give me one hour. And by the time, <laughs> by the time I woke up in the morning, the panel was back in order. So uh, thanks to the hard work and the network of Latifa from CityWorks DC and CareerWise, CityWorks and CareerWise DC, I am pleased to introduce our first panel, which is an opportunity for us to hear directly from True two extraordinary young women who are current youth apprentices working in the region. In just a moment, you'll hear from Leah 
who is a youth apprentice um, based here in Washington, D.C. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. And you'll also hear from Stephanie, a youth apprentice from PG County, right over the border in Maryland. Um, and by last, last but no means least up here on the panel, I want to introduce uh, Brittany Brady. I mentioned Brittany a second ago. She is CEO of our national partner, National Alliance for Partnerships and Equity. Prior to joining NAEP in that role, Brittany has also served as an executive director of the Brewer Foundation Future Leaders Program. Um, and she was most recently the Chief Development Officer at Lumen Education. She holds a bachelor's degree in English from the University of Maryland, go Terps, and a master's degree from the Harvard Graduate School of Education, where we were classmates, uh, which we didn't know until recently. Um, and more wonderfully for this panel, Brittany is herself a graduate of STEM programs at PG County Public Schools. So please welcome me in joining this tremendous trio. And thank you for permitting my five minutes of overage. Brittany, over to you. Sounds good. Thank you, Taylor. And nice to see everyone today. Can we get another round of applause for our apprentices here, please? So as Taylor mentioned, I serve as CEO of the National Alliance for Partnerships and Equity. And we partner with PIA to really focus on youth voice. So it's appropriate that I'm here with our youth apprentices who are brilliant and amazing. And I think you guys are really going to be wild. So I won't take up too much airtime. I'm going to actually start off by asking both Leah and Stephanie if you all could share with me where you are, what your role is, and a little bit more about yourself. So your name, your role, and what your apprenticeship is like thus far. My name is Leah Sloan. I attend KIPP DC College Preparatory. I am a finance apprentice with Freddie Mac in DC. Uh, my name is Stephanie Romero. I'm a carpentry apprentice with Prince George County Public Schools. So how did you all hear about the apprenticeship program? Did you do your research? Did you hear it from someone else? What brought you to be a youth apprentice? How did you find this opportunity? So for me, it was mostly because of my teacher. He would always bring it up to sign up for this apprentice. It's a good opportunity. And well, most of my classmates didn't want to, so I was, I'll do it. And um, from, that, from that moment, he was always supportive that you're going to get it, that you have the skills. You're always passionate about everything, to um, learning new things. So I signed up, and I was waiting for like a while to get the email. And then one day, like in the middle of the night, I just received congratulations. So that's how I got in. See? <laughs> how about you, Leah? Um, for me, I saw the CareerWise DC email through like, it was sort of like a spam thing. So I, I didn't really pay much attention to it because I said, it's COVID, they just keep emailing, whatever. But something told me to read it. Something told me to read it and I applied to like every opportunity they had. And I started sharing it with my peers and I was really excited. And once I got the congratulations, I was the happiest thing ever. <laughs> Wonderful, that's great. And speaking of your peers, what do your friends think about the fact that you're an apprentice? What does your family think? And how is it impacting like your local peer community? Are you sharing about your apprentice experiences? You said you shared it with your friends. You said your friends didn't want to apply. So <laughs> tell, me, tell me more about that. Okay, so for me, my parents are really proud. My friends are, I thought they weren't really going to care because they're like, oh, like, it's <laughs> construction and carpentry, like, it doesn't matter. But no, they became really supportive. They're always wishing for me to keep going higher and higher. And I do share with my friends now, like, you should try it, like, even though it's not kind of late because we started in high school. I'm like, you could look into other companies. And yes, they're starting to research, so hopefully they could get into one soon. Wonderful. How about you, Leah? Um, for me, I have a friend, and we do everything together as far as opportunities. So she, I made her apply with me. <laughs> and she applied, and she got into HR. And she's also an apprentice, well, a former apprentice now. But she was an apprentice with me. Um, I shared it with everybody who I knew had the skills to become you know, an apprentice with the company. And ever since then, I feel like my family is proud. My friends are proud. Everyone's proud of me. And I, they're my motivation to keep going. And strive through it <laughs> are you all proud of yourselves of course of course <laughs> <laughs> okay we often describe youth apprenticeship as a triangle there's a the high school the college and the employer and you're kind of bouncing all between those different areas 
What is that like? How do you, first of all, maintain balance? You guys are busy ladies. Yesterday we had a call with Leah and she said, oh, I have an interview. I have a meeting with my supervisor. I'm going to have to leave. I'm going to have, have a hard stop at 2.30, <laughs> right? And I'm like, oh, yeah, you've, you've been in the work world. Uh, so how, how do you balance everything? And, and do you have to give up anything? Either one. Okay. Um, for me, sometimes it's tough because I overwork myself a lot. So I feel like, like yesterday, I'm always like 2.30. Okay, now I have another one at 3. Um, and I feel like I did a lot of community involvement my junior year in high school, but now my senior, I'm starting to dial it down a little bit and be more realistic with myself to not overwork myself. Um, for As far as balance, I feel like I can take on any and everything. I don't know why, but I do, and I, I am going to. So I feel like as long as I just keep myself going with the simple things that matter to me. Like I do a lot of community involvement and I know that the more and more that I go about the specific things that I want to keep doing, it'll keep me balanced and it'll keep me going. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I needed to hear that too. How about you, Stephanie? Um, for me, I don't know how I do it. I, I, go to, <laughs> I wake up really early to go to work. From work, I go to my carpentry classes, and then after that, I had to do my college classes to become an accounting. So, like every day is, I don't know, I just go to sleep and then wake up the next day, do the <laughs> do same <it> thing. Again. <laughs> yeah, but it's just the motivation to see like all my family and friends proud of me, and making making sure that they're gonna have a great future. Thanks to me, is my motivation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no one can say anything after that, right? <laughs> so you guys have kind of alluded to some of the things that you learn on the job, right? Like I wake up early, I do it again, you have to schedule yourself. Like mm -hmm. that's kind of what on the job learning is like. Have there been any things that have surprised you from your apprenticeship experience? Have there been any things that you really think you need more support? How are you garnering that support? How are you really carving out that space for yourselves? Well, for me, I feel like the, I, during work, I do have um, most of the support from all my coworkers. So, but there are a few that don't want to help me. But <laughs> um, I take the support like any from anybody like willing to teach me every day, and that's what keeps me going, like learning more and more. So that's what's helping me um, develop my skills. Right, you found your people. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Leah? I feel like at Freddie Mac and even career-wise, I had that support. I know I can just shoot a Microsoft ping. Is that, that's what they call it, I think. But <laughs> I can just ping someone. And I try my best to like get out there and network with like my coworkers and stuff like that because it helps me know who's who and who I can go to and who I can feel comfortable with with certain things because Freddie Mac is interesting. They have a lot of red words on their documents, so sometimes I can't ask questions about certain things, but it keeps me motivated and makes me feel better about myself that I'm really out here doing a lot of different things that a lot of people around me aren't, and I wish that they will. So that's a little bit of balance with me. <laughs> yeah, that's actually really interesting, and I want to ask a little bit more about that because you all are having very unique on-the-job experiences, right? And so how does that vary or differ from your peers or even jobs that you've held previously? Like, have you worked what people consider a typical teen job mm -hmm. before, and how does this experience differ from that? Okay. <laughs> um, this experience is more unique for me because I'm not in person. I'm remote. Um, so it's kind of different because I'm in my room at my desk on the meeting with like a blurred background and so is everyone else. And that kind of makes me feel a little isolated, but you know, getting in office is a whole new chapter that I'm not ready to open yet. But one day, um, <laughs> I feel like specifically for me, it helps me feel better when I like, Freddie Mac has this thing where like you can check people, what they're doing, what they're working on. I try to do that so I can get myself into more things, ask people if they need help with certain projects, just to give myself that little bit of different exposure with different projects and tasks so I can open up to pick a college major <laughs> to see what I really like and narrow it down a little. So it's giving you more experiences to kind of try things out. Yes. Wonderful. How about you? Can you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> How does this differ from other job experiences, either that you've held or that your peers have held? So like she mentioned being remote, right? Like 
typical teen jobs, you might work at Chick-fil-A right. or when I was in Prince George's County, everybody worked at Six Flags. Like that was like yep. the place to work and it was the best summer job. <laughs> I did not work there. But, you know, how does this differ from other work experiences you've had? Uh, for me, well, I was always doing internships. So I would work at my high school at a townhouse. So it was becoming, um, learning, like working on hands because I was usually on the computer. It was like a quick change, but it was something I did like because I like working hands on. And compared to my peers, they were they were surprised because uh, young women going into a carpentry field where it was mostly dominated by men. So, but they were really supportive. They were like, you go girl, like keep <laughs> doing it. And yeah, it was just a great switch for me to have. That's wonderful. And I want to highlight for the audience both of them sought out these opportunities. Both of them were looking for ways while on these work experiences to really continue to develop their learning and their knowledge. So as people that are in positions to open up these doors, make sure that people have pathways to those other experiences. I love that, Freddie Mac, you can kind of pop in and say, hey, what are you doing? How can I learn from you? That's really how you learn on the job and how you really advance. Mm -hmm. So I love that. OK, what would you say are the biggest benefits of your apprenticeship? What would you say you've learned through your apprenticeship so far? So we've heard a couple of things, but what's the, the highlight for you? So you said college major, you said working with your hands, but big picture, what's one of your biggest takeaways from this experience? That I'm getting paid to learn. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I agree, actually. Um, but I will also say the big takeaway for me is the different projects that I am doing and working on sometimes they're a little more harder than others and with me wanting to be an accountant and majoring in accounting I feel like the task that I'm doing is similar to accounting work and it honestly steers me away from it but <laughs> at times I, I think it's a great experience for me and it's great exposure and it's a great opportunity for me to take away even in school I can help um, I'm in NAF and Finance Academy. So it helps me in that class as well because I, I know the exact work that they do behind the scenes. So that's how helpful it is for me. Oh, that's fantastic. Are you seeing any synergy between your college? Well, you're in a carpentry apprenticeship and you're taking carpentry classes. So there's clear alignment there. Yes. But how about for your accounting classes? Any alignment between those oh, two? No. Yeah, no. I don't think so. <laughs> but it's a great, it's opened up um, different for me, well, I want to take accounting too, so one day I could run my shop and even more, go higher than that. So that's why I wanted to take accounting. That's great. Okay, so we think, especially at NAEP, that youth should be involved in the design and delivery of youth apprenticeship programs. Um, this can help ensure that young people have positive experiences and make sure that they meet your needs. So what advice would you give to the people in this room? Do not hold back. <laughs> what advice would you give to the people in this room who are building youth apprenticeship programs? And how can we all do a better job of listening to your voices in this process? Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say always keep motivating um, young people because like they say, it goes one ear, it comes out the other. Just keep pressuring them to they tell them like the benefits, like the money, like that's what they're looking for. So it's always just keep talking to them, keep talking to them. And that would hopefully help a lot of young people. Um, for me, I would say build relationships. I feel like that's a very important part to me because the more comfortable I feel with someone, the more change that I can, I can try to help influence or help someone else work with. So I feel like with the supervisors, the people that are there to help, I feel like once you build a relationship with them and get to know them, like not just about your job title, but like who are you outside of your job? I feel like that's what makes me feel more comfortable and makes me feel welcome when I'm working with those professionals. Yeah, would you say that gives you a sense of belonging? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how about you? I know you mentioned that you know you have some folks on the job that help you and some folks that don't. Those people that are on the job that help you, what are what are they doing to cultivate that feeling for you? Well, they're always saying that, you, oh, you're doing a good job or you should try this way to make it easier for you. They're never putting me down or trying to belittle like the few skills that I have and building up. So they're always trying to um, help me grow and grow every day my skills and be more confident in the field. That's wonderful. 
Are there any challenges that you've experienced that you're feeling comfortable to share? You don't have to deep dive, don't feel nervous, but it's helpful for people to know when they're thinking about supporting people and building relationships, some of the challenges that you might encounter, whether on the work or from navigating all of these different spaces. So are there any that you're willing to share? I would say that my age is something that a lot of people, like grown people try to like kind of push me away like oh you don't really know that much you're too young or but it's just something like make them feel welcome even though they're really young or really old like it doesn't matter just always make them feel welcome right that's wonderful um for me i've had four supervisors within my year span of being at freddie mac now that has been different and unique for me but i feel like the challenge i face is I have to switch from being a student in a classroom next to my friends and a teacher with directions on my paper to being an apprentice with this big long title that and I have to live up to it and I have to do the work and sometimes I'm scared to ask questions because I don't want to feel like oh I'm too young and I feel like sometimes in the meetings everyone around me is so advanced in the field like they have degrees they've been doing this for years and I don't know that much so I feel like that's been the most challenging for me because I have to switch like not my personality but like I have to switch like my focus and I feel like sometimes I can't ask for help because the work is confidential or I feel like I don't want, ever want to feel like I can't do something so I try to push through it even if it's a little off, <laughs> but you know, that's how I try to get through it. That's the biggest challenge for me. Is there anything that people can do to make sure that they see you? Because that's a bias, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna go ahead and say the word. It's a bias against people that are younger. Even though both of these young ladies are clearly brilliant, if people are assuming, oh, you're just 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 25, it goes all the way up to there. How can people or what would be helpful in that? Would it be helpful if you just had a peer that was in that setting? Would it be helpful if your supervisor was speaking truth about it? What, what would make you feel more comfortable about that very innate bias that so many people hold? Well, for me, since we work with different people every day, I would say um, like the supervisor telling them, or oh, make sure like, she learned something today or because mm -hmm. sometimes I'm doing the same thing over and over and I'm trying to learn more and more new things. So it would just be like talking to everybody saying, okay, like everybody has to learn something new, not just doing the same thing over and over again. That's wonderful. How about you, Leah? Um, for me, I would say my supervisor was also working in high school, so she understands almost everything. And that's really helpful for me because I feel like I love working with people that understand because I feel like people can say it all day, but you've never done it or you've never been through it, you don't really get it. So I feel like the pair that I have now is perfect for me because she understands like, I have a thousand assignments. I'm doing college applications every day as well, as long as doing accounts payable, whatever. <laughs> so sometimes that's much more helpful for me when I can just say, hey, things are rough at school. And she always asks questions. She's always interested in learning like what's going on, what's going on around me, how can she help, how can she make it better for me? So I feel like that's the most helpful part for me is working with someone that understands where I'm coming from and has been in my shoes before. Indeed. So someone that's been in your shoes and also people in positions of power, making mm -hmm. sure that that space is ready for you. I love that. Okay, when thinking about, both of you all mentioned the fact that getting paid <laughs> is a, a big benefit. How is that providing a benefit outside? Like how, what does that mean to you to be able to get paid to learn? Well, I could buy like whatever I want now. <laughs> and it helps me like for my future, like paying classes that, um, since right now I'm in a primary scholarship, so I get my classes paid, but on further that, like trying to get my bachelor's or master's, like having the money aside that will help me like, further my education. Beautiful. Um, for me, I feel like, again, what she said, I completely agree. Having your own money is nothing better than that. Um, <laughs> and soon, I've, I've learned how to save and how to, like, sometimes I get what people are saying when, like, you save for a rainy day and it rains that night. <laughs> I get that <laughs> because that happens a lot. So I feel like it's preparing me for, I mean, when well, I'm 18, but it's preparing me for my adult life. Like I need to save my money. It teach me money management and everything with like the money part about it is so important to me because I feel like my specific choice of apprenticeship with finance, I felt like I would do it for free. I mean, I would take that back if I was doing it for free, <laughs> but, <laughs> 
but I feel like me getting paid is like very important to me because it's something I'm passionate about. So I feel like if I'm doing it and I'm getting paid, that's like the most important thing to me because it's like now I can teach other people. I can try to help other people get on my level, not my level, I'm not going to sound like that, humble myself, but <laughs> help people get to where I've been and like teach them and help them along the way. So I feel like that's the most important part to me. Yeah, lifting as you climb. Mm -hmm. And both of you all being invested in at this age, you, can, you don't want to sound, I, I will not be humble for you, okay? <laughs> they want to get on your level because everybody wants that freedom and flexibility of having their own income and being able to invest in what they need to invest in. College applications. Every time you send off your SAT, you have to pay. Everything costs to make that next step. And so you having the money you don't have to ask someone else right. for means that you can do whatever you need to do for yourself, mm -hmm. which is really powerful. Mm -hmm. Okay, before we open it up to the audience for questions, because I'm sure we have a lot of questions in this audience. I see people's heads nodding and smiles and everything, so they're probably ready to go. <laughs> but before we do that, what are your plans for the future? What do you want to do when you finish your apprenticeship? And what's next for you in terms of work and learning? So give me the grand vision for where you see yourself. And it doesn't have to be perfect, because the paths change. But what do you see for yourself now? For me, it's running my shop, and at one point, running the um, accounting like positions and all of that. So being higher and higher every every year, trying to get a like a raise. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, staying years has been a little ro rocky. So I've I've always wanted to get a degree, and I've decided that I want to get my degree in finance. I mean, not finance, accounting. <laughs> um, but working at Freddie Mac has told me maybe not. And sometimes I feel like, yes, I'm doing, gonna do it. But I feel like I also wanna become a full-time apprentice to get that experience because school does cut into it a lot because I can't give my all sometimes. So I'm trying to balance that, but I know I wanna get my degree. Um, just like her, entrepreneurship is a part of my pathway as well. I wish to, I'm gonna get my real estate license in December. Um, I also wanna fund my own business with like helping people experience opportunities. And I feel like me getting my accounting degree will help me be able to find ways to fund that better it's saying like the CEOs and also an accountant so I feel like that's where my pathway will take me and it better not change because I'm tired of trying to figure out what I want to do <laughs> transferable skills you never know the path can be circuitous something that I love to ask youth so we talked about very concrete things that you want to do when you're looking 10 years into the future who do you hope to be A millionaire. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, I want to be that someone that I wish I had, whether regarding my community, regarding a supervisor, regarding, no, I'm not going to say a parent, but <laughs> regarding, you know, I just want to be someone better than I am today and rich, of course. So. Of course. And Money I want to give back. Motive. Yes. And I want to <laughs> give back to my community as well. So that's my goals, my long term goals. Absolutely beautiful. <laughs> Okay, now I think we're ready for questions. Uh, I believe I see a microphone back there in the back. Please speak into the microphone. We have people joining us online. They would love to hear your questions. If you do not speak into the microphone, I'll just repeat it in this one. So <laughs> please be sure to say it in the microphone. And there's no question too big or too small. And I'll tag in so you guys don't have the answer. Okay. <laughs> we also have the program leaders from both of these programs here. So if you have more concrete questions about the nuts and bolts of how the program is delivered, we have a couple of folks in the room that can also speak to that. So any questions that anyone has, please feel free. Please come to the back to ask your question so that the webcast audience can also hear them. Hi, your story is incredibly inspiring. Um, question I have is, do you find yourself explaining youth apprenticeship to the other adults in the school, like counselors, teachers? Is this something that is kind of something known in your school, or is this something you have, find you have to explain to the other adults as well? For me, it's something that is known in the schools because um, throughout the years they had other apprentices for either for other trades to like electrical, cosmetology, nursing, pharmacy. So for me, it was already known in my school. I just had to ask about it. Um, for me, not really, but really, because sometimes I, I try not to 
make it seem like, because I have friends and I have peers that say, where are you going? When, I, when I'm dressed like this, like today, <laughs> I don't want to say, oh, I'm giving a speech for my apprentice. I don't want to sound like I'm better than anybody. So I try not to talk about it too much, but I do want to talk about it because it is something that exists and it is something that more people should become a part of and they should definitely use the experience as something that they can learn from. So I'm just wondering, uh, when you first applied, did you rank what areas you wanted to be an apprentice in? In other words, did you have to put like carpentry first and medical or, or second? How, mu what, how much choice did you have in applying to where you were going to be an apprentice? I already had one choice, which was <laughs> carpentry, because I was already in the class. So I was, but I could always branch out to other fields. Um, I could go to the sheet metal shop or painting. So it's not just, I'm gonna stick to carpentry. I could always branch out, but I only had one choice. Um, for me, it was a little different because they did have multiple options. Um, in my application, I definitely kept mentioning that I was a NAF Academy of Finance student. Um, so my career wise DC advisor said, we're gonna get you in finance. And I got in finance, so yay to that. <laughs> Great, good morning. So good to hear your stories. So thank you for being with us today. Finances came up a number of times, rightly so, right? And I'm wondering about um, opportunities for you to learn personal finance. Has that been a part of any of the conversations that you've had formally or informally in the midst of all this? And, and if not, is that something that would be helpful to you yeah. and your peers? Yes, I feel like it would be extremely helpful. So for me, I'm in the NAF Academy of Finance, which is a three-year course of applied finance. The first year, it was COVID, so hey, <laughs> it's COVID. Um, the second year, um, I was an apprentice, so that's sub that substituted for it. But I always had a relationship with the two finance people at my school, so I am still learning my personal finance experience. But I always hear from my mom, like, you're in there, why are you spending all this money? <laughs> you should know better. So I feel like the personal finance part, <laughs> it, definitely, it definitely works and it helps. It's very helpful, especially when you're in the finance field because you know what not to do and what to do, especially when you're working with a company and you have to budget their finance, which I've done before. And it's been very interesting when you see all of that money <laughs> has to be budgeted in certain different categories. So I feel like that's definitely something helpful for people who don't have those kinds of courses at their school or offered. Thank you. So hi, my apology for being late this morning. Um, myself and my um, coworkers are from Potomac Job Corps Center. And my question to you, um, um, I, mean, I, I do apologize for being late and I didn't get the late getting the front end of the story. You guys are in high school still, right? I am. Uh, I graduated class of 2022. Okay, so my question is, what impact has being part of a pre-apprenticeship, um, has it um, teetered your life? I mean, has it given you a better vision as to where you're going? Because in, um, so what we do at Potomac Job Corps Center, often we try to um, encourage our students to not only get a trade if they have to get their high school diploma, but we also try to encourage them to participate in an internship program. We just had a young man that finished and he went to Colorado. He's getting about 20 something dollars an hour. They're paying for his um, residential for two years. He has to pay nothing. So how has this internship impact you and where do you see yourself going forward? Um, for me, is I think it paved the pathway for me. Mm -hmm. It gave me a lot of exposure and different opportunity to see as a teenager working from a different position than, you know, a rec not a, a peer. <laughs> it gave me a different vision on how life can be and how it will be like in a professional setting. I feel like I've gained a lot of skills early. So like, for example, my supervisor switching four times on me, <laughs> that was a little crazy. And I feel like for someone, when I speak to that about like adults that are already in the workforce, they can relate to that because that's happened to them before. But to me, it's a little different because I'm younger. But I am gaining those skills to learn how to navigate through those challenging moments like that. So I feel like it's paved the pathway for me, definitely. For me, well, just like um, your student, I'm getting my classes paid and I'm gonna get my journeyman's license. So um, it's always given me a vision. Like I could do more than what um, some teachers told me or more than what people expect of me as a woman. So it has helped me a lot. Great, thank you. Hi, 
Hi, thanks for being here. Really appreciate hearing your stories. Um, I want to combine a couple of questions folks have asked about um, both options, like what options were avail available to you, and also youth voice. So I'm wondering if you have any advice to folks in the room about how to get ideas about what young people might be interested in building pathways for, and how we, how we can navigate doing that when maybe there's like a if you haven't seen it, you don't know that you can be it type of situation. So like, what advice might you have about creating more options so that more of your friends might be like, yes, that's for me, I see myself in that. Um, how can we kind of get that, get those, um, things that might be inspiring to your peers and also share things that they might not have considered at the same time. Do you have any advice for that? Well, for me, I would say always have like speakers like from different um, areas, young speakers, older speakers, like so they could relate to them and that will help them see, oh, like I could take this path or I could take this path um, based on their likings. Um, for me, I feel like being a part of CareerWise DC, I kind of, I'm going to be honest, I stalked their website for a long time until I got hired and I, they had videos about like different fields and pathways. So that really helped me because I got to see, but now that I'm in the field and actually I get to see it, I feel like the most helpful thing would be like maybe making a video about here's HR work, here's finance work, here's technology work, here's what you'll be doing, here's some things that I've done. Because that can run someone away or that can, you know, bring them into it. So I feel like that's most helpful for me. And definitely research, like having those resources and opportunities and people to speak about their unique experience will definitely bring the youth towards it for sure. And how, would, how should we get like the thoughts of your peers, their thoughts about what we should be building. Because I feel like that's, there is a lot of like, let's put out there so that you all know what we think maybe you should be considering. Right. But how do we make sure to flip that on its head so that we're building pathways that young people are like, hey, I feel like you had me in mind when you built that mm -hmm. because that's something I'd be into. So how do we do the reverse of that? How do we get, how do we sit at lunch with your peers and be like, okay, what should we build? What fires you up? Um, I feel like when you create a safe place, we're honest. <laughs> so I feel like as long as we're comfortable and we're open to speak and we know a little bit more about it and know the goal, I feel like that's exactly yeah. where it helps and where it can definitely push the youth to understand where you're coming from and how they can build more onto what's already done or make their own pathway or something like that. I feel like once you build a relationship and you get the, they get to understand both part, points of view from both uh, the partnership and the youth, I feel like that's what really matters. I agree. <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate it. I also want to underscore making sure that youth are part of the building of the pathways. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times people think if you build it, they will come. But if they weren't part of the building, then how do they know to come? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Hey, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. I have a very simple question. You talked earlier about balancing everything. What do you all do for fun? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I play sports. I play basketball. I play soccer. Um, I'm trying to learn how to do like acrylic nails, so like I could have that as a side business. You can do yeah. that. <laughs> and yeah, so I just like doing different little ho um, hobbies. Um, for me, my dad, he just started real estate, so I want to become a realtor too, and I want to intern under him and some of his peers. So for me, I feel like me getting my real estate license will be a little fun for me, because it'll pave a new pathway. <laughs> Aren't they incredible? You're getting fun by picking up a new trade and learning how to be a realtor. I mean, I would have said doing my nails on the weekends, you know? Great. Um, but also for fun, I get involved in my community. I try to give back and do better things to help my peers become like me or like other apprentices around. Um, and I like to go out, and it's very, very fun to go out with your own money. Because <laughs> not much your parents can say, you have your own. Exactly. <laughs> we have one final question from the online webcast. What are you most proud of accomplishing in your youth apprenticeship? For me, it's being a young woman entering a male-dominant career field. That's just something I'm proud of. Girl power. <laughs> It makes me most proud when I get to read what I've done 
in my experiences and what I've done. Like, for example, my LinkedIn account, like my job title and what I've done in the post, the little posts I can make. That makes me so proud because it's like, this is really me. Like, I wish I can show my younger self. So that's what makes me proud, along with hearing my family members talk about me when I'm not supposed to be listening <laughs> and stuff like that. That really makes me proud. And I get to, and most importantly for me, I have a big family and I'm like, I don't even know, the middle child, I guess now, but <laughs> I have four younger siblings, five, and I have plenty of younger people in my family. I know that when they're my age, they'll be held to a standard. And sorry, but not sorry. So <laughs> that's what pushes me. Just want to make sure that everybody thanks Leah and Stephanie for your insight again today. Can we give them another warm round of applause? Thank you. Um, before we get started on our next panel, I um, wanted to introduce our President and Chief Transformation Officer, uh, Paul Butler, to welcome you all again. Paul. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. Um, I haven't smiled this much since I've been at New America, and it's been about 18 months, and I can see from the back heads nodding and heads nodding, which is fantastic. Um, first, I just want to thank Mary Alice for allowing me to participate um, and to join you this morning. Um, so as Mike said, I'm the President and Chief Transformation Officer, um, and that word transformation um, and overall the work of PIA is so important to me personally, uh, in addition to being important to the work of New America. Um, Taylor shared the evidence of what PIA has done over the last four years, the work of uh, of PIA and the work that all of you are doing means so much to me personally. There, I've had maybe seven, eight jobs over my career. Um, I've been on the board of the one nonprofit for about 25 years. Um, it is a development program in West Harlem for black and Latino youth. So when I came to New America and when I met Anne Marie and when I saw the work that PIA is doing, I said, of course. This is a place that I want to be. And Marie used this word earlier, and she said the work of Paya is awesome. And I want to go back to that word, but I want, to, I want to make sure that we're reminded of a part of that word that we have to take with us as we do this work. You saw the evidence of what's happened over four years. Imagine what's going to happen in 14 years. In, imagine what's going to happen in 24 years with Leah and with Stephanie. There is a wonder to the work. There is something that we do not know that we are going to do to help young people see their possibilities. And I just want us to carry that through the day and through the remainder of the work in the next 14 and the next 24 years. It is so important to remember that while the evidence must be there and when we can see it, there's something that we may not see. And we talked about that last night. I know Tracy, we talked about that last night and the work that you're doing in Kalamazoo. So important. And I just wanted, I wanted to just take a minute and just wanted to thank Mary Alice for allowing me to share that. There is something that we will not see in this work. And it is still so important that we do it. So thank you all for your partnership and thank you all for doing it every day. Mary Alice, thank you for your leadership. This is incredible and happy anniversary and happy birthday to Paya. <laughs> Paul, thank you very much for those remarks. Um, good morning again, everyone. My name is Mike Preble. I'm a senior policy analyst at New America Center on Education and Labor. Um, a thank you again for joining us today, um, and a special thanks to those panelists who just left the stage, Brittany, Leah, Stephanie. Um, it's so great to have you in our, uh, joining us today. Across four years of PIA, um, I don't think we would may, may, we've met many people who would uh, disagree that the most exciting, the most rewarding part 
uh, of building youth apprenticeship programs and partnerships um, is getting to meet and to hear from the young people who've uh, heard about these opportunities and who've decided to use them to launch their careers to continue their intellectual and their civic journeys into adulthood. A close second, I think, is seeing the types of partnerships that start to emerge um, between businesses and other key youth apprenticeship stakeholders in support of those young people. And we've seen many of these emerge over our four years with PIA. The next panel that we have for you today will give you a sense of how those employer partnerships uh, start, how they grow, uh, through the perspectives of two initiatives that I've had the good fortune to work with closely uh, over four years of PIA, CareerWise Greater Buffalo and Career Launch Chicago. We've got our panelists joining us just now. No, not all. Thanks, everybody. From the great city of Buffalo, New York, uh, second from audience left, we have Daphne Ross, who is Senior Director of College Success and Communications for Say Yes Buffalo. Say Yes is a scholarship for Buffalo Public School students established in 2011. Uh, and the lead organization for CareerWise Greater Buffalo, a PIA grantee uh, and an affiliate of CareerWise USA. Also from Buffalo, to Daphne's left, we have Michelle Marie Gant. Michelle Marie is Director of Diversity and Inclusion at M&T Bank, where she works across the organization to design and implement uh, its diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy. She works with Say yes Buffalo to support M&T Bank's uh, youth apprentices in their business services and information technology verticals. Uh, moving westward, or I guess rightward to the Windy City, we have Stephanie Gomez, Director of Career Launch Chicago at the City Colleges of Chicago, another PIA grantee. She leads a crack team of educators and coalition builders working on youth apprenticeships in automotive technology, manufacturing, healthcare, IT, and other occupations. Uh, also joining us from Chicago, I'd like to welcome Darius Caffey, uh, who is the IT Youth Pathways Program Manager at the Rush Education and Career Hub of Rush University Medical Center. He partners with Career Launch Chicago to support Rush's uh, IT youth apprentices. Welcome, Darius. Moderating our panel today, we have Kate Kramer, a longtime friend of the Center on Educational Labor and a key leader of the Partnership to Advance Youth Apprenticeship. Kate is Deputy Director, excuse me, Deputy Executive Director of Advanced CTE, a national nonprofit representing state, and, uh, state career and technical education directors uh, and a PIA partner since the very beginning. Kate, thank you so much for being with us today. I'll turn it over to you. All right, well, hello, everybody. Oh, yes, please, please. <laughs> Um, and we're all lamenting um, the unfortunate position of following that panel, but bear with us as we talk about really building um, an opportunity to talk about the nuts and bolts. How do you build this? How do you put this together? How do we create those amazing experiences that our learners are having and frankly create a lot more of them, which is why we're all here. So I'm really excited and honored to be moderating this panel um, with two of the grantees from PIA to really, and, and really importantly, not just the intermediaries, but their employer partners and why they're here, why they're in this work, what it looks like and what the work looks like ahead. So why don't we jump in? The first question is why? Why did you do this? And I'd love to start with Stephanie and Daphne. Um, you know, you obviously already working in this space, but what made you apply for a PIA grant? What made you want to actually launch and pilot youth apprenticeship in your communities? So why don't we start with Daphne and then we'll sure. go Stephanie. Good morning, everyone. Um, so for us, Say Yes Buffalo is a nonprofit. Ten years old, we were founded as a promise to Buffalo Public School students that they would have a tuition-free college education. So we are intermediary and we've um, had relationships and kind of sat in the center of, of K-12, of higher ed, of business, of philanthropy in our community. So as we started to explore this pathway, it made sense for us as an organization to, to be the lead intermediary because we we're already in the middle of that space. Um, so what we know over the past 10 years is that a tuition-free college education is still too expensive for some of our students who are dealing with um, economic circumstances and challenges in a racially segregated city. The cost of actually attaining a college, a tuition-free college education is, is something that not all students can take advantage of. So we decided to, to create this pathway as an opportunity for our students to have a different entry into um, economic mobility through earning while, they're, while they learn. So um, the conversation started several years ago. We had six inaugural employer partners, one that is here today with us. And the goal is really just to provide a pathway to students who um, aren't taking advantage of our scholarships. So we're excited that we just launched our pilot. And uh, for us, it just made sense for, for our, for, in our community for us to, to take the lead. Okay. Stephanie? Yeah, so we had a couple of 
things that were sort of setting the stage for Career Launch Chicago to get into this work. Um, the one, what, the first one on one side was this unprecedented partnership between our Chicago public schools and our city colleges of Chicago known as the Chicago Roadmap. So this is um, the first time that, you know, this is, we're really talking about taking a relationship that in the past may have had moments of successful collaboration, right? So think of it like almost like this, where sometimes CPS and CCC made it happen, to a place of like full convergence where now our strategies are uniform and we're taking these two huge institutions to come together to create that seamless path for high school students to and through college and into the career of their choice. Right? And we're able to do that work through five different domains, one of them being career exploration and career preparedness, which is where Career Launch Chicago lives. So on the one side, you have this backing of these huge two institutions to do this work. On the other side, you know, we have our sectors, our employer partners. So um, we had sectors that were dealing with the urgency, the reality of their workforce retiring, right? So when we talk about the advanced manufacturing partners, you know, they're like, we have five to 10 years before a large percentage of our folks step out. And we need to have a talent pipeline to funnel into these positions. When you look at health and IT, there's a projection for growth and we're, we're seeing the same need, right? We need to have talent. How are we going to meet this? And our answer was like, well, the talent is in our backyards, right? They're in our Chicago public schools. They're in our CTE programs. They're in our programs that maybe are not CTE, but are still connected to those sectors. And so it, it's sort of like this simultaneous, you know, you have the industry, you have this unprecedented partnership, and these things are coming together. And now here's Career Lawn Chicago ready to lift up this work. It's wonderful. Um, I want to I shift over to um, Darius and Michelle Marie. And before we ask you the why you took this plunge, curious what you were already doing in this space, right? How were you already working with youth? How were you maybe working with your partner, say, Buffalo and City Colleges? Kind of how did this fit into the portfolio that was already there? And then we'll shift to why you decided to go all in on Youth Apprentice. So um, why don't we start with um, Michelle Marie and start with Buffalo and then move to Darius? Sure. You know, so we've had a relationship with CS Buffalo, like it, I, at a minimum I know um, I learned about our relationship from the perspective of sourcing for uh, existing programs, whether it be for internships and perhaps some other, other opportunities there as well. And, and similar to what we're talking about, like a lot of us have that like talent pipeline concern. Like, you know, we want to be thinking ahead and thinking about where we need to get ahead of the challenge of people retiring as well as looking to bring on um, new, bright, innovative individuals, right? And, and, and we need to, to challenge the system, right, to shake things up. So we've had um, some other um, successful programs thinking about thinking outside the box, right, of the standard or what the, what the historical situation has been. It's like, you know, from, especially in the technology space, you know, we've had programs where we, we one more, most recent one is looking at, um, we did a data, data analytics boot camp, for example, reaching out to the community to and look at the various community members and say, there's an opportunity to train people who may not have had the degree in, say, that area. And we have the tools and resources. We have a tech academy we stood up that we can actually, you know, upskill. Um, and, and we have other programs that it's not necessarily focused on just youth, but it could be any um, age group. Um, similar technology, but it's, a, it's an apprenticeship program from a technology lens as well. So this fit into it, uh, our portfolio from the perspective of we haven't done this before. We know we need to do it. We want to dismantle some, some of the, the standard historical systems that have that inherent bias and systemic um, challenges. So this is just a perfect opportunity um, to kind of really dig in and say, let's figure this out. That's great. Darius. Yeah. And I'll agree with that same point of us getting to the point where it was like, you know, we see the work that's being done around the city. We see the different connections that we can make. We see the different resources that are being put out there, especially among these times. Why not take full advantage of those? So for context, the Rush Education and Career Hub is a cradle to career pipeline program. So we work with age levels across grade bands. So we work as young as kindergarten, elementary school, middle school, high school, and now working with adult learners to be able to help, you know, actually create that pipeline for them 
from their level of education and getting training and certificates to them actually having direct access to a lot of those career opportunities. So for a long time, we have been doing a lot of this work in small increments with a lot of our enrichment programs and making sure that we're building connections with the different communities that we're a part of locally, statewide, and you know, sharing out more of the resources that we have available, not only as, as an organization, but as a healthcare organization from the more larger umbrella of what Rush does. So having the opportunity to now take it to the next level and bring in students to Stephanie's point to be able to bridge that gap between what they've been doing in high school, what their aspirations are, you know, post-secondary, whether it is college, career, trade, anything like that. We wanted to be able to bridge that gap for them and provide support for them in those times where, you know, traditionally, historically, a lot of students lose support in those areas, especially transitioning from high school to college or figuring out kind of what those next steps are in terms of kind of that level of experience and training and skill sets that they have. So we were able to kind of take a little bit of a step back from what we were doing and kind of visualize and identify where some gaps were. So that way we can use that feedback to build off of the program that we're building now with Career Line Chicago with the other apprentices and students that we're able to bring into our programs. So it's wonderful because, I mean, obviously you two get it, right? You're like the <laughs> ideal industry partners. You understand it. You understand the need. You understand that, yes, we need to focus on upskilling and reskilling, but we also need to build the path plan. Lower what, what the, creating those multiple pathways for students. So great. I'm curious, does the, re do the rest of your organizations understand that, right? Like that is such a challenge. When we think about one of the biggest barriers when we talk to people standing for the apprenticeships, it's, yeah, it's getting in students, but it's getting employers on board. It's mm -hmm. understanding that it's okay to hire a 16, 17 year old. And we just saw two young women who I think all of us want to hire, right? Like right now. <laughs> yes. um, so I'm curious, you know, did you have the support internally? Or if not, how did you build that support? How did you get not just you to say, yes, Darius, yes, Michelle, I'm signing up for this, but to get your organizations, right, to say, we're in. We want to pilot this. We're willing to take this plunge. Sure. I can start. Sure. So for us, you know, there was, um, it was, for, on, the, on the outside, it was fairly easy because I knew our CEO was bought in, right? So I don't think I ever had a conversation with him directly about this topic, but as soon as I knew he was in, and then our chief diversity officer, who's my manager, was in and supportive and part of the steering group with, with say, yes, Buffalo, it's just a matter of, we're going to figure this out now. Right? So then it became more of a situation where I feel like I kind of went on a campaign, an internal campaign mm -hmm. within our organization to say, listen, we don't have all this figured out, figured out yet, but we are going to figure this out. And I'm going to, and I kind of did my best to make it tangible, right? Use a very, uh, for me, like I have a background in accounting and auditing and finance. So I use that as an example of, all right, so I can speak to you know, entry level, accounts payable, general accounting, et cetera, and, and take them through what this could be, what that pathway could be, mm -hmm. and talk through with my counterparts across the organization and use their example of that entry level role and be able to say, let's talk about the different types of experiences that an entry level person might have. And let's talk about the competencies and the skills that either you want them to come in with or we can make sure that we build. And let's talk about the type of education. What kind of classes do you think you want to make sure that they take? And everyone, it's very easy for everyone to jump to. I want a four-year degree and say that thing. I want a master's. Okay, let's talk about what's actually necessary to get started and to be supportive along the way. Let's think outside the box here. And when you, that conversation had to happen several times. But we were able to get there. And the, we can really pull out the specifics of what's actually needed, what type of curriculum, what type of classes are critical, as opposed to sometimes a lot of the filler classes that are just in there that are important, but they're not necessary to get the job done. So once we kind of got more of that kind of campaigning out of the way, then it became a lot easier to, for people to visualize, like, yo, we can, we can support this. We can do this. So I think that's, that's kind of how it got started. Great. Darius, I'd love to hear yeah. your story. Yeah, and I would agree that the visualization of it is important because that's a large part of kind of what we've been doing over this last year, kind of moving from our pilot program into a full blown hour year is getting more employer partners and more community partners involved in the work that we're doing. So very similar to you, I felt like I was kind of on a campaign, you know, sharing out resources that we have available, how we can recruit students and get them, you know, in these quality equitable experiences, but also making sure that, you know, we're addressing their needs as well and that we're listening to them and kind of figuring out you know what gaps can we you know work to solve or 
find solutions for that are directly impactful to the students and the participants that we're working with and not just us as an organization. Um, a lot of it was very exciting to talk about because a lot of employers are like, oh, you know, you all, you know, we're working to train these students, get them certified, and, you know, you're working to connect them to different folks. So a lot of employers were excited about it, but I think on the back end, it was more logistical. Mm -hmm. It was more so of, okay, we have these students, even to the point that Leah had mentioned earlier, of, you know, these young people coming in and not necessarily knowing too much about the business workspace, but still being passionate about the work and getting the employers to be able to understand that side of things and allow them to see the growth of the participant and not, you know, directly expect them to come in and know everything off the bat. But for us to be able to have that transparent conversation with the employer partners and the different departments that we're working with is that, you know, these students aren't coming in as full-blown experts, but they will get there. You know, this is why we're connecting you all to them so that way they can have more experience in this field, in this department, you know, in this specific role. They can have conversations with you. They can actually feel like an employee and a staff member that is a part of your team and not just some extra person coming in to do work for you. We want all of our participants to feel valued in their experiences. So as we're having conversations with different departments and even with our internal team about how we're working with students, we always want to make sure that it's intentional and that it's something that, you know, it's not blown out the way or something that kind of randomly comes up like they know from the start what this experience will look like and they know that it's a growth period and they're committed to this process with us and that's you know what we want people to do is be able to go on this learning journey with us because that's what it is you know all of us we're still developing programs we're still piloting new programs it's all a learning journey so we want the students to also be involved in that learning process with us from both ends, the internal and external side. So give them a quality experience, but also taking a lot of their feedback to help us build out an equitable program as well. That's great. So all we need to do is replicate you in every single <laughs> community, right? I mean, I think that that's the challenge is you guys, you get it, you know how to talk about it. So I don't have time for this, but something to think about and for the group is how do we arm, right, industry, the people that are passionate with those right conversations or how to tailor and talk about skills, not just education, how to inspire that this is what we have to change business, right? Because it really is actually changing business and how we do that. And that's hard, but I mean, evolve or die. I mean, that's where we're kind of at, I think, in the economy and the workforce. So I want to bring um, Stephanie and Daphne back in. So we got the why, now the how, right? You got on board, we are, we're in, let's figure this out. So I'm curious, a couple of like nuts and bolts, like how did you decide with, with your industry partners which occupational pathways to start in? Um, there's obviously broad. So we'll start there and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to the, also how do we make sure that college, right, is equally important to the, the career um, piece as well. So whoever wants to start. I can start, yeah. Um, so we launched, we were just talking about this because I feel like we launched our, fir our first cohort so long ago and we actually launched our first cohort in February of this year, <laughs> okay? Like, and when we talk about it, like, you know, two years ago, and it's like, no, dude, like, we just did this. <laughs> um, and, you know, I came on in November of 2020, like, super pandemic, right? Like, I was hustling, trying to find, you know, folks who, who understood it, people like Darius who saw the vision. Um, and when we got started, you know, it was like, what positions are we looking to, to work on? To be 100% transparent with you all, it was, what is the easiest thing we can make happen? right? Like, mm -hmm. we have to get this off the ground. Um, definitely taking into consideration, like, the, the trajectory for this role, right? So that is something that you consider. You're like, what, can, what comes next after this? Um, but it, it was like, what can we get lifted that won't maybe ruffle too many feathers that will just get us moving and gaining momentum? So that, that was a big piece of it. You take the job sector analysis, you do look at the job projection growth, you look at the trajectory within for mobility, but it was also like, how do we make this happen fast, sure. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for, for us in Buffalo, um, we, with the help of New America, did a labor market analysis of what the region's workforce needs were. So we settled on advanced manufacturing, business operations, and IT as, to start with our verticals with, you know, room to grow. We're hoping to expand that. And, as we move to year three. Um, so once we had the industries in place and we had our six inaugural employer partners, um, like MNT, who is a shining star partner in our, <laughs> in our work, um, we had partners like Michelle Marie who, who did those internal campaigns and really figured out 
what are the um, entry points that students within those three verticals were able to take on. So there was some deep work that was done and there were also some employer partners that had immediate needs in specific positions that, that fit within the vertical. Mm -hmm. So it was a combination of how can we make this work and this is what we need right now. Yeah. Triangulating the what can we just do, right? Mm -hmm. What's the easiest to do? And then what is what are our employers asking us, right? We need help. And mm -hmm. I think it's, it's all of the above, right? Whatever, whatever it takes to get it off the ground, right? Like mm -hmm. just to get that first one going to build that proof point and then to be able to scale. So I want to talk a little about the college aspect. I mean, I think what is so unique about youth apprenticeship we heard today is it's not just workforce training, right? It is not an alternative path for students not going to college. It's an alternative path through college that actually gives meaning, right? And pay has always benefit. So obviously, Stephanie, you're at City Colleges of Chicago. Um, Stephanie, you all started as a college promise program. That's so core. How do you really make sure that that balance stays? And I'm actually really curious, how do you also work with your employer partners to make sure they're equally valuing, right? Not just the on the job and the work-based learning component, but also that they're taking college courses and high school courses kind of all the same and make sure that, it's, that all those things really come together and provide all those options for students. Um. Given our history as an organization, a college access organization, it just is central to, to what we do in this program. Um, so it was never a question, I don't think, from the beginning as we started to roll this out that the college coursework would be embedded in the program. It's just a requirement of, of our employers for them to make time for our students to take that related instruction. Um, and our related instruction is embedded at a local private college, so our students are enrolled in um, associate's degree programs, but they're taking them on a part-time basis um, so they can ease into college because this is an alternative to t going to college full-time. Um, but we worked with our employer partners to, to pick the courses within those programs that we wanted to sequence that would align with the role that they were hired for, for business operations and IT. And then we have a, a workforce training center, the Northland Workforce Training Center, that we partner with for the RTI for our advanced manufacturing roles, but those courses are also college credit bearing as well. So our tuition um, scholarship actually pays for the coursework. Our Promise program pays for the coursework and the employers um, are only covering the wages at that point. Wonderful. Yeah, so um, I think that's, you know, sort of similar there. Like when we bring on an employer, one of the first things that we do is we evaluate our academic program at CCC, right? So we'll show the employer like, okay, you want, a, you want an apprentice in machine tech? These are the programs we have at City Colleges. We share all the classes, you know, the path. We say, does this make sense? You know, so we'll kind of have it vetted by the employer to make sure that it aligns with what they're going to be learning. Um, and then the other piece too is, you know, with Roadmap, which I mentioned, the Chicago Roadmap, the second domain of Chicago Roadmap is access to high quality programs. And the goal of that domain is to increase the number of CPS students that are earning early college credits. And one of the ways that we're doing that is with our model pathways. So the model pathways, which we have one in health, we're launching one in IT, we'll have another one in advanced manufacturing. Um, the idea is that all the students that are going through this are able to graduate with up to 15 college credit hours. Right? And, and they have the youth apprenticeship. So by the time they're coming to city colleges, they're just positioned really nicely, mm -hmm. right? Um, the other piece too is, which is not necessarily college, but it's, it's a key piece, is we have a youth apprenticeship course. So all of the high school students are enrolled in this youth apprenticeship course. It's an honors course. They get graded for this class based on how they're moving in their work process schedule. Um, and it's also what allows them to leave early from school, right? So I think all of these pieces are important in sort of institutionalizing how this works so that it's not a one-off, um, but it is just how the work moves. Yeah. I feel like the amount of work that is under <laughs> what both of you just described to build all those pieces and have it all come together with all yeah. those partners, I mean, you say it in a very succinct way, but I mean, I know that that is, there's so much we can learn as we go, go a level down. So. I now want to talk about working with youth, right? What does it actually mean? What's that experience? And I love um, to start with our employer partners in terms of what have you learned? What has this meant for your companies, for your, for your other partners? Um, what have you learned about working with youth and, and what that you know, means for your culture? So let me start with Michelle. Sure, you can start. Um, you know, 
the first thing that I think we, like, I think we, we all probably had an expectation of, you know, we, we know that they're high school, you know, for us it's high school graduates and it's more of, you know, we cannot assume anything, right? Like, I think that is something that once we realize, oh, we may have made an assumption, let's go ahead and correct for that. So, for example, you know, um, in the past, the majority of our work, our uh, managers, et cetera, may have assumed that they come, that the students come in with having certain skills with Microsoft Office or certain understanding of email etiquette, right? Or all, say those things that we just have just assumed would happen, right? Like, so we're trying to, we go into it just knowing that there's certain things we're going to build in from a programmatic perspective that we're going to provide, and then there's going to be other things that we learned and we have learned that, oh, okay, so let's make sure we build that into the program level support that we're going to provide. So one of the things that we, we definitely realize up right off the bat is we want, similar to what the young ladies were saying earlier, we want to make sure that we're building that environment that's supportive. So while we have um, the, the great partnership we have with CS Buffalo, they have a, 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 a career um, a success coach, mm -hmm. right? Like that's been important and critical. And at the same time, we have a program management team that's also working with them, some of which are more near peers to them, and so that they can feel more comfortable to talk with them so that we can flesh out some of the things that we probably heard and learned from the young ladies earlier today. And things that we may not, we may not have realized we need to actually focus on. So we, we quickly also, as we set this up, we, we created, um, we did our best to create an ecosystem so that they came in having um, a buddy, right? More of that near peer, someone that's assigned to them that they could hopefully get to know, relate to, ask anything they want, right? Anything they want. And in addition to that, that hiring manager, in addition to also as they move on, they have a mentor as well. So we, we're going into it knowing that we don't know everything. Mm -hmm. And we have to be ready, be empathetic. We have to be ready to, to listen, to get feedback, to respond, uh, and, and, and be able to just, just be open, right? And, and not come, go into it with assumptions. So, um, some of the things we've learned too, in, in particular, is um, the support that may be needed as they're juggling, right? There's a lot going from being in, in high school, they have to juggle, you know, their, their, their course curriculum, going to work, doing their homework, all those different things. And that, again, historically we may not have thought of, like someone else has to, you know, we never had to worry about that with perhaps if you're hiring someone just an entry level role or if you're hiring an intern, et cetera, because it's on, during a summer break. So it's, what we're finding is that we're building more empathy and more kind of um, into, the, into the program itself. Like it is a requirement for us to listen and to react and be able to work together to solve for the challenge amongst us within our employer base and also with our partners with CS. Darius. Yeah. For us, I would say that it's probably been two things that we've been able to identify. And one would be the state of the world that we're in right now and learning what that looks like from a young person's perspective. They're growing up in what this new world, you know, will look like in terms of remote learning or hybrid work or even in the way that we engage with youth and employer partners. So like they're going through a lot of changes. But then we also notice how the needs of young people have changed over time and they might not need the same things, you know, that they did five years ago because we're in a completely different state of living, learning, working. So we've been able to take a little bit of time to actually learn with the students about you know kind of what the things that they're going through and ways that they might need to be supported. A clear example is remote learning, you know, kind of transitioning from this hybrid virtual world that we were in, we thought that you know having students on a more remote learning platform would be better off for them, but it's been 3 years of that and yeah. children are tired of it. <laughs> um, so even just you know having conversations with students about kind of their experience in some of our certification classes and the way that they're engaging with employer partners and their internships whether that's in person or remote, being able to take you know, full advantage of having them in our space to be able to help continue to cultivate the workspace that we're building and shaping, not just for us, but also for them. Um, I was at a convening last week with partners from JFF, and one of the things that stood out to me uh, was a conversation that we were having around creating our workspace to be environments that you feel like they can also be our colleagues in. And to me, that really stood out and kind of changed my perspective of the work that I was doing because, you know, 
as an employer partner coming in, training students, you were training students to enter the workforce, but are we necessarily training them to be our colleagues, sitting right next to us on panels, having these same conversations? So I think that just, you know, being more mindful and intentional in how we engage and how we understand and listen to young people really does make a difference in how we change the work that we're doing to create better equitable outcomes for all of them. I think we could all use more empathy um, <laughs> generally. Yes. And I mean, what I'm hearing is this isn't just benefiting these apprentices. It's benefiting the, your entire company. And frankly, this is an insight into what's coming, right? This is the next generation of employees. And they're really good, like, bellwether and insight into how we do need to involve, right, mm -hmm. to continue to be an inclusive, belonging environment, which is what younger individuals, what all of us want, but in, especially Gen Z in terms of what they're demanding as they enter the workforce. So last question, and then we will open it up to all of you. Um, so it's a pilot. We started, you've been in, in works for, I mean, you say less than a year, but COVID year, so that's like a decade. Um, obviously, you're a little, like, tiny bit farther along, but still really early, mm -hmm. ramping up. What's your vision five, 10 years? What does this look like? What's the dream, right, that you keep this going, you move from the pilot to, to the proof? Um, how do you scale it? What does this look like 10 years from now? So Daphne Moore. Yes, I think for, for us, we do want to be at scale. So right now we are um, in six of our high schools. Um, our goals over the next five to 10 years is to be at every high school. We have a team of career coaches that are embedded in the high schools doing the student recruitment. So our plans are to grow that team um, so that every student in Buffalo that wants access to an apprenticeship will have that access. Um, so that will in, include recruiting students and making sure we're at scale, but also growing our employer partners and relationships. Um, we had an overwhelming response in our first year of student interest in the six high schools that we were in. We had uh, 53 positions and over 1,200 applications for those positions. Um, so I think the, it showed us that the desire is there. Students want access to, to good paying jobs and they want them right after high school. So we want to be able to provide those opportunities. Um, so growth, growth is what's next for us. Meet the demand of those 1,200 mm -hmm. students. Yes. Amazing. Mm -hmm. um, Stephanie. I love this question because I love imagining what this could look like in 10 years and five years, you know. Um, I echo a lot of what you're saying, Daphne, and, and, but I do want to say like one piece that I, I hope we're at in 10 years and I hope that Career Launch Chicago plays a pivotal role in really is in like, demyst like demystifying what youth apprenticeships are, right? Um, and I'm just going to call out like, Stephanie, is this your dad? Your coworker, okay, okay. I, I was like watching him record, and I'm like, this is so beautiful. <laughs> Still beautiful, by the way. Still super beautiful. Um, but in my mind, like youth apprenticeships become that thing that like families, that coworkers, that caregivers are so excited and proud about. You know, like how family brags about that one cousin who got that full, you know, four-year ride, like. I want families to brag about, you know, their, their, their young person in their life who got that youth apprenticeship and is going to move into that next year. And I think a lot of that work is just demystifying what youth apprenticeships are and creating that awareness, especially in our city in Chicago. I, you know, I feel like that's the reason why, um, like, I, I believe youth apprenticeships are so, like, life-changing and can be life-changing. It's why I do this work with so much tenacity and passion. But it's like, we need to get the word out. Like, we need to get it out more, even more and more and more and louder and louder. So we're at the place where we have, you know, tons of employer partners meeting that need that our students are demonstrating um, and having, you know, communities behind this. Like, families need to know what this means because they play a big role in this work. They're, they're part of our ecosystem and they, they have to know this. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you all. I want to make sure we've got time for questions from all of you to be able to ask these amazing, there they go. Hello, and uh, Stephanie and Daphne, just to start, thank you, thank you, thank you for your tireless work on this. It's sometimes a thankless job, so 
your gut, you are both wonderful. And then to your employer partners, um, Darius and Michelle Marie, like this is it's so incredible to see employers taking the lead of this work. And so just thank you for what you're doing and for being here. My question to you is kind of twofold, and you touched on it, but I want to go one layer deeper. Were there any specific policies in your company that you had to change to hire these young people? Anything specific that you actually had to change a policy or work with HR to adapt? And then my second question is, one of the challenges we have is, how do you get your managers excited about hiring these young people? So you kind of get different camps of that. Some of them are really, really excited. Others are like, this is a lot of work. I'm not sure I know how to do all of this. And so I would love to hear a little bit about how you've inspired that generation of hiring managers, because they're so critical to this movement. And it's a lot of the responsibility and work sort of falls within their camp. I can start. Um, so to address the first question, so one thing that we started to do a little bit more is to kind of expand on the current apprenticeship program that we have to bring in more adult learners. So that was a little bit of a barrier with HR because we realized that a lot of students, participants, interns that come and work at the Rush University Medical Center are typically college level students. But within this, next, this last year, we wanted to make sure that we address equity across all fronts. So that meant, you know, people that weren't enrolled in college level programs that still were looking for an extra layer of education, of training, to get involved, to make connections. So we had to work a little bit with HR to adjust our job descriptions to remove the barrier of students needing to be enrolled in college to participate in our programs. And we realized that that was a huge barrier that needed to be addressed a long time ago because it was something that restricted us from engaging with certain communities that still needed that same level of support. Um, so to be able to do that, it, it helped us increase, you know, kind of the work that we were doing, but to also have more conversations with our internal and external teams about the barriers that some of our participants were facing. So to the second question of how do we get more of our managers excited about it is letting them know about this work and bringing them into the conversations and the meetings. One thing I try to do is I try to introduce a lot of our interns and apprentices and students that we work with to a large part of our team so that they, you know, can make those connections, can see a familiar face, and so that, you know, the person at the top and the top, they're still involved in these experiences with them. They, they get excited to see a room full of participants that are coming to, you know, serve us and to train with us and to learn with us. Um, but I think that a large part of the barrier is sometimes that gets missed in translation. We do a lot of work and we have a lot of programs that are going on all year long. And for sometimes some of those leader managers, they don't have as much flexibility to be at every event. So one thing I try to do is, you know, try to have some of those staple events for the managers to come out and actually see the work that we're doing, for them to be involved in the process, have conversations. They might get five to ten minutes a part of the program to give their spill of how, you know, the proud they are, give a little bit of background to the work that they've been doing as well. Because I think that that's also important for us to be transparent with the participants that we work with on kind of what our journey has looked like, education-wise, career-wise young, you know, growing up, whatever that has looked like for us, they're probably also going through similar experiences. So I love for all people on our team to, you know, be vulnerable enough to be able to share that so that we can continue to build stronger bonds and relationships with the participants that we do work with. So for us at M&T, you know, we didn't have any policy changes we needed to make. Um, I thought there might have needed to be when it came to thinking about our job architecture, for example. Um, but a few years back, um, the organization already gone, went through a job architecture kind of re, this redo. And I say that in the context of being able to see, like, for a particular job, a particular level of job, did they need what's required, right? Like, by way of education or experience. And then after working with our, my colleagues in, within HR, uh, specifically in the compensation group, we were able to quickly see that, you know what? When we're done, they're going to meet what's here, right, by way of, the education they're getting by way of whatever the whatever certification they're going to get when they're done what by way of the actual job experience that they're getting while working with us they're going to meet those requirements so i was kind of elated that and like that it, that wasn't a, bar a barrier for us it wasn't a blocker um when it comes to the excitement you know um you know there was a couple things so when i, I talked about earlier about that campaigning i intentionally went to people that i knew like senior leaders and executives i knew would be excited behind it um, and I went to the level that I knew I needed to go to. In some areas, it might be the more executive person. In some areas, it might be the senior person below someone. Like, I knew who to go to to get that excitement and support. And then from there, it's then like how, how, working with them to figure out who the right folks would be to kind of be that person to be working hand in hand with, with that apprentice. 
And what was really helpful too to kind of build up that excitement and that understanding as well as working with Say Yes Buffalo, that racial equity training, that was a great kind of way to kind of level set and start with this is, this is what we're doing, this is why, and this is what some of the things you're going to be thinking about or need to be thinking about while we're working with, um, with our apprentices. And then from there, internally within m and we had some orientation efforts, right? We had an orientation training session, onboarding, whatever you want to call it, specifically for our hiring managers, those supervisors, to kind of make, make sure we demystify kind of what we're talking about even more, at, be able to answer their questions, be able to get them excited and see how we're all going to be working together, how we're creating this ecosystem to support what we're doing. Um, so I think on an ongoing basis, it's that providing that connectivity amongst them as well so that the supervisors can have that networking capability to say, what's working for you? This person may be having a challenge, this, this manager may be having a challenge over here. This one may, is like, you know, I've got some tools, I've got some ideas, and share it with a program management team so that we can perhaps build that into the program going forward. So there's a lot of that kind of connectivity and ongoing support so that we can all realize why we're doing this. If we bring it back to the why, like that excitement has to be there. And if they're not there, then you're not right for the program, quite frankly, right? Like, and that's gonna happen, and it has happened. It's like, okay, well, we're going to go ahead and make this change now, <laughs> and, and go ahead and correct for that. So, and we keep going. All right, we might have time for one question or two if they're really quick. So we'll see how <laughs> this will be quick. This uh, question is directed towards Stephanie and Daphne. I'm really interested in um, how you recruit your employee partners. Um, I come from Siemens, and we have, um, I'm proud to say we have a couple of youth apprentices um, in our company. And I feel bad sometimes because I feel like we've exploited these kids. Like, you know, they've been featured on every panel, <laughs> on our website. We're really proud of this, and we showcase it but you know it's just happened you know through these connections that the local facility might have had with um, you know their local kind of NC tap or Chicago for instance but how like do you collaborate you know maybe with other grantee um, you know you hire grantees to share like oh we're working with Siemens like you should guys try to like how are how, what is the strategy when it comes to employer recruitment mm -hmm. and your employer so. partners yeah so for us, for the first um, six employers, they were on board through the exploration phase as we were figuring out what this looks like for our region. So they were already there. They were already committed before a program existed, which was amazing. And um, we're just recruiting now for year two. And my colleagues that are here, Stephanie, I don't know if she's in the room, she leads our business partnerships. And, um, you know, for us in Buffalo, thankfully, um, it just kind of spread organically that this was happening and employers have reached out to us um, even before we had to go into actively recruiting for positions. They're reaching out to us and we got a lot of, um, we did a press conference in the fall and got a lot of publicity there. Um, so with our goals for next year of 50 apprentices, we already have our six um, coming back, but we also have about 15 that have expressed interest. Um, somewhat organically, we, we did reach out to a few of them and we do work with our local Chamber of Commerce as well to bring in new employer partners as well. Um, so we're, we're lucky and in a, in a position where employers are asking us how can we be involved in the program. I'll try to be quick, um, <laughs> like I see you. So uh, for, for Career Launch Chicago, we knew we had like focus sectors. So similarly, you know, we wanted to do advanced manufacturing, IT, health, we grew beyond that. Um, and how we bring employers is, I am like cold calling. I am knocking. I am going to places. I'm sharing what Career Launch Chicago is. I am finding where are their employer tables. Can I present in front of them, right? Um, so there is a lot of like drive. You know, I'm pushing and pushing and pushing. Um, we had six employer partners in our first cohort. We're getting ready for cohort two, right? We had 21 apprentices year one. We're going to have, we have 68 slots for year two. We went from six to 14 employer partners. And now it's getting easier because mm -hmm. the word is out, mm -hmm. right? And like, I think that's been key is like, the more we do this work, the more people know and hear, like all of our year one partners are returning, right? That says something. That says they enjoyed the experience. They're telling people that they know. And so that's, I think that organic piece is going to happen. But year one was a lot of like, hey, I got this thing, <laughs> let me show you, you know, <laughs> um, and get people on board. Mm -hmm. 
Great. Well, please join me in thanking our amazing panel. I am very pleased to introduce our next panel. So we've gotten a chance this morning to hear from apprentices, from employers, and from intermediaries. Our next panel is going to focus on policymakers. So youth apprenticeships provide seamless pathways from high school to the workforce and higher education, but it asks a lot of those systems, and building bridges across those systems is no easy feat. So our next panel will focus on some federal and state level system leaders who are leading ambitious change agendas to align those systems to support the expansion of youth apprenticeship. So our panelists who are going to make their way out shortly include Tony Harrell, who is a state director of career and technical education with the Indiana Office of CTE under the governor's workforce cabinet. Since joining the Office of CTE, he's been heavily involved with redesigning Indiana's CTE programs of study and work-based learning. Tony has also served in school administration as a principal, an assistant principal, and a dean of students for over nine years, and he has also taught business education and economics and served as a professional career internships coordinator for 12 years before becoming an administrator. Mini Lamar is a senior advisor at the U.S. Department of Labor. In this role, he advises on federal workforce policies and legislation. He leads and supports industry engagement strategies, registered apprenticeship priorities, and sector-based strategies. Previously, Manny served as the founding executive director of the Nevada Governor's Office of Workforce Innovation, where he focused on career pathways, apprenticeships, and statewide strategies for strengthening the workforce system. Dr. Bruce Mack is here with us. He is the vice president of economic development for the North Carolina Community College System. And prior to taking this position, Dr. Mack served as the Vice President of Economic and Workforce Development for Cleveland Community College, where he served for 25 years as a faculty member, a director, a dean, and vice president. Prior to working in higher education, he came from industry, where he worked as a manufacturing engineer and an applications engineer. And these panelists will be capably moderated by Rachel Stevens Parker, who serves as the Director of Workforce Development and Economic Policy uh, at the NGA Center for Best Practices. Rachel oversees research, policy, guidance, and technical assistance to governors and state leaders on expanding equitable access to economic opportunity. Current areas of focus include workforce and economic development innovations for a more equitable economy, including youth apprenticeship. So with that, I will turn it over to Rachel Stevens Parker. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you, everyone. It's such an honor and privilege to be here and be part of celebrating four amazing years of the partnership, partnership to advance youth apprenticeship. Uh, I've just got to start uh, briefly by saying the National Governors Association is so proud to be part of this partnership uh, and to be involved in and supporting the work of so many amazing grantees that are part of PIA and are doing incredible things to really advance and elevate young people across the country. So thank you on behalf of governors uh, across our 55 states and territories for everything you're doing in their communities. Um, just a kind of quick introduction on uh, other reasons I'm here in addition to um, our involvement in PIA. Um, the National Governors Association, I mentioned 55 governors of our states and territories, and we really exist to serve and represent those governors and their interests and their policy priorities. And the Center for Best Practices, where my team is, exists to sort of help them explore innovative solutions, identify best and emerging practices to help them achieve their goals in creating better economic opportunities in every community within their states and their territories. Youth apprenticeship and other models of high quality work-based learning for young people have been and are continuing to grow as a huge priority for our members across the board. And I think that's really reflected uh, you know, the reasons for that are reflected in the conversations we've had so far here today and in the achievements of the grantees over the last four years. I'm really excited for our conversation today because I have the honor of talking to an incredible group of panelists here about one of the biggest challenges that we see in our work when we work really in many policy areas at the state level, certainly in youth apprenticeship, and that's the challenge of alignment. Uh, aligning across education, workforce, economic development, post-secondary education systems, employers, it's challenging. It's hard, a little hard to talk about, but it's really hard to do. And so we have some wonderful panelists here who are 
the doers uh, and the change makers, as Taylor said earlier. Um, and I'm really honored to be here uh, learning with them and with you all today. Um, so to start, I'd like to kind of invite each panelist. Uh, we were kindly introduced by Kelly with New America, but if each of you could just share a little bit more about what you're doing in youth apprenticeship, kind of the unique vantage point you're bringing to this discussion on alignment to support and advance youth apprenticeship, that would be wonderful. And I'd also love if you could include why this, why youth apprenticeship became such a priority for your state or, in Manny's case, for the Department of Labor. We'll start with you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Thank yeah. you guys for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. We're just excited about this journey. There's a lot of great things happening in the great state of North Carolina. Um, we have a lot of alignment that's happening between the, the K-12 system and the community college system. In North Carolina, we have 116 LEAs. Uh, we have 58 community colleges as well. We've seen some really work around, uh, some great work around youth apprenticeship um, and since 2017, since we came on board with the PIA initiative. Uh, of course, this all was done before I joined the system office. I joined the community college system office last June of, um, of well, June of last year. I do want to recognize our director, uh, who's actually over the apprenticeship program, Catherine Costellos. She's actually in the audience here as well. Thank you, Catherine. For all you do. But Catherine has been with the with the apprenticeships for a while. Uh, she's. She, I'm not even going to tell you how long she's been there because she <laughs> she won't meet. But she's. But but she's the guru. But, um, but, you know, a convergence happened in 2017 at the community college system that, that, that really it was just an initiative of a lot of different things going on. We had the PIA initiative going on. Um, we had our apprenticeship program that moved from the Department of Labor. Uh, it, it went to Commerce for a short while. Then it moved to the community college system as well. Um, so we had a lot of different things happening in North Carolina. We changed up our workforce system as well. Uh, we went to workforce boards. We went to prosperity zones as well. So when we, when we look at the work that's, that's been done around youth apprenticeships, uh, and I think North Carolina has really strategically positioned themselves to do youth apprenticeship as well. Um, when I think in 2017, we had about just a little over 600 um, youth apprentices between the ages of 16 and 18. Uh, when I looked at the numbers this year, we, we write it, we're right at 1,400. Um, and that's this actual fiscal year. So last year we had about 1420, um, and then we're almost at that number this year. So we more than doubled our numbers in North Carolina as it relates to youth apprenticeship. And I think a lot has to do with, of course, all of these initiatives that's happened, including the PIA initiative as well. So uh, let's, let's kind of give North Carolina a round of applause for doubling yeah. those numbers. <laughs> Thank you. So it's great to be here. I, I feel like I'm uh, kind of crashing the party a little bit. Uh, part of the reason I say that is the, the, the lion's share of the work around youth apprenticeships in Indiana ha has been completed by local intermediaries, including Ascend, who uh, is one of the partners. But we also have some other groups in our state, um, you know, HEA out of Elkhart, uh, which is in the northern part of the state, has always been involved in this. Um, I think where we kind of came into the play. So the Office of CTE is, is very, uh, a little bit uniquely positioned in the state of Indiana. We, we serve under the governor's workforce cabinet uh, rather than, than the Department of Education. Uh, there's only one other state that, that has it structured that way. Um, I think that kind of gave us a kind of a natural connection to the workforce development side of this, um, which, I, as we go through, I'll, I'll probably talk more about today just because I think that's so vital to, to what we're doing. But also as a part of being under our, our basically our state workforce board, uh, our office has been spending the last three to, to four years redesigning every one of our CTE programs of study. And it just became so apparent that the same goals that we had for our CTE programs and what we wanted to accomplish through our CTE programs were the exact same goals that we were talking about when we were talking about improving work, high quality work-based learning experiences and specifically looking at the youth apprenticeship model uh, kind of as a way of delivering those CTE programs. So uh, about a year ago uh, uh, this time, um, we didn't really take it wasn't formal, but basically informally, our office has kind of accepted responsibility for um, the uh, work-based learning experiences, youth apprenticeship uh, work that's taking place at the state level. Um, again, it's just one of those things that kind of happened. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't something formal or anything like that. 
But I, but I think what we've come to realize over the last six months, or, or really the last year or so, in working more closely with Ascend and some of the other intermediaries is that they've done great work up until this point, but we really need to have more support from the state level to, to really help to grow this out and to, and to help scale this out. So uh, that, that's why this is so important, and that's why it's great to be here today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm um, Manny Lamar. I'm excited to be here. Um, I feel like did a little bit of deja vu because um, when Paya launched a few years back, I was on the other side um, sitting at the state and the governor's office. Um, but in terms of you know, involvement and engagement, um, we really see this at the Department of Labor, a, a sense of urgency. We feel a sense of urgency. Um, you all may be familiar, already be familiar with some of the statistics already, but you know, we have 4 million youth that are disconnected in the country. We have an unemployment rate of 8.5% for uh, uh, young adults, right? And so when we look at those statistics, it, it, it creates a sense of urgency. At the Department of Labor, it's complemented um, by the fact that our acting assistant secretary, Brent, and our secretary, um, both have a deep passion and background and engagement around um, young adults, particularly around thinking about youth apprenticeship opportunities. So it kind of marries those worlds together. As well as for me, in my background, um, when I was at the state level, one of the things that kind of really pushed us um, working with NGA um, uh, a lot through the work-based learning uh, cohorts, but some of our broader work is I had surveyed a thousand young people. Like my, back, like my belief is go to the source that's closer to the problem or the issue or like they're going to be closer to the solution. And so surveying a thousand young people across the state, both in terms of focus groups and literally talking to them, um, the lessons that we learned from hearing from them drove an initiative to help us get new legislation um, at the state level to particularly around young adult um, opportunities, particularly around thinking strategically around youth employment. Now, I say that to say is now at the federal level, it's helpful to like blend both the state and federal kind of perspective. And at the Department of Labor, we've articulated an explicit um, priority around youth employment, around uh, youth pathways and youth apprenticeship. And really those priorities consist of three things. One is a business commitment to uh, young adults. We know that quite frankly, for this to be successful, we need uh, employers at the table to engage. So a, a lot of our work is around connecting with industry um, and elevating, and we hear that from industry, that sense of urgency that you know, they need to find the talent. Um, and we know that the longer it takes to connect to a, a young adult to create these youth apprenticeship opportunities, the harder it is, um, uh, to, uh, and the more expensive it becomes, quite frankly. Number two is we want a no wrong door approach. And so that really connects to the uh, local workforce board. I sat on the state workforce board and we always talked about like the resources around supportive services. So as we think about youth apprenticeship, it's the importance of thinking about some of the challenges we hear with this transportation, insurance. Um, there are solutions that already exist and we just have to get the partners together. So that's number two. And then the third one is quite frankly, and this is where again, youth apprenticeship is paid work experience. So we know that quite frankly, when we talk about equity and the importance of it, if the young people aren't being paid, quite frankly, um, then um, we're being limiting the opportunities uh, to individuals that aren't able to. So that paid work experience, business commitment to young people, and number three is uh, um, paid work experience, business commitment to young uh, people, and no wrong door approach. Those are our three kind of guidelines at the Department of Labor um, that will drive my discussion um, today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Manny. And, you know, it's really striking to me to hear kind of shared across the stage here the level of urgency around this and what's built such momentum over the last four years through initiatives, including PIA. And just thinking about where we can go in the next four years with the shared momentum is really exciting. Um, you know, bringing the great programs that so many of us are working on to scale, alignment across K-12 post-secondary workforce is a really important component of that. And, Tony, I think you really touched on that and kind of the sense of urgency around doing that in Indiana. Um, I'd love to get a little more specific on exactly kind of why it's so hard, kind of defining the challenge. So if each of you could maybe share in your view, uh, you know, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges in state or federal policy that's facing K-12, higher ed, and workforce efforts to really align and scale youth apprenticeship programs? We'll start there and then I'm gonna ask uh, on a more positive note about some things you see working well. <laughs> Manny, why don't we start with you this time? Sounds good. So I see three things as um, uh, challenges and also opportunities to alignment. The first one is coordination. Mm -hmm. And so we have these like different worlds 
Um, uh, uh, sometimes I jokingly say they're like cousins. So Wioa, Perkins, Apprenticeship, they're really all cousins, right? Um, they are in terms of the connection to the uh, federal government. Um, and oftentimes, they're seen almost as like not un unrelated relatives. So we're trying to like put things together. So, so the first part is coordination. What that means is um, having a central point, whether it's an office, individuals, or a group of individuals, that's helping to coordinate across. Number two, I think, is language. And so this ties into the coordination because sometimes, like I'll give a concrete example. In apprenticeship, we say RTI, Related Technical Instruction. And so I remember being on the State Workforce Board and we were working with Perkins and CTE and we were doing like the New Skills for Youth Initiative. Someone from CTE would say, you know, would not realize that. We're, all we're just talking about is classroom instruction. It just sounds way more fancy than it needs to be, but that's just the term that we use, right? And so like translating that language. So I think number two is like language. Um, so um, coordination, um, language, uh, those are like two, I think, really yeah. key pieces. And the third quick one on policy, I think it's just the incentive structure. Mm -hmm. So I think about high school graduation requirements. When we talk about youth apprenticeship, quite frankly, if you're still incentivized as a counselor or graduation is how many students are going directly into a four-year institution, which is fine, but if that's the only incentive, then there's not a mechanism to incentivize the ecosystem yeah. to pursue and scale youth apprenticeships because it's not part of the incentive. Like, you know, there's that saying, we, we, uh, we measure, like people essentially align to what they're being measured about. And so I think like at, the, at state levels and of course at federal, like how do we incentivize so that if you create a youth apprenticeship, if you have young people going into youth apprenticeship program, you're also rewarded um, for that as well as if, you're, if they're going into transitioning into a traditional post-secondary. No, I'm glad you mentioned it. I think we've started to see some really interesting movement at the state level around things like graduation requirements Correct. and some of those other metrics, which is great. Um, Tony. Yeah, so uh, I think he was sitting in the same conversations that we've been having for the last three or four years yeah. um, because those are all the same things. And it, it's really interesting to me to think about this from, so I was a business education teacher who never even really thought of himself as a CTE teacher because that was the trades down at the other end of the hallway to uh, a building level principal who then thought he knew CTE, who then went to work and found out everything that's in Perkins, and now has transitioned over to kind of the workforce development side of this, and, and now see like all the things that are in WIOA that are also in Perkins. So I think the hardest thing though, like when you're talking about K-12 to higher ed, is they, they don't know WIOA. Um, and, and sometimes that's intentional, right? I, I mean, I've always said that Education doesn't like thinking of themselves as workforce development. That is not, that, that, you know, it's, it's the joy of learning. It's, the, the, it, it's not necessarily that they're preparing them for the future. And I think that's a real challenge. Um, I think the other thing that we kind of are still battling in Indiana is we've had this, we've had an incredibly broad system of CTE. Like we, we do about 67% of our students uh, participate in CTE courses during the, their high school year. We are extremely blessed to, uh, our state made a, about $170 million investment into CTE enrollments last year. Um, that's above and beyond Perkins. That's, that's state level dollars. Um, so schools are really incentivized to offer CTE programs. Um, but also at the same time, we, we deliver it through a variety of models. So we have we have career centers, we have co-ops, we have individual schools, comprehensive high schools that are offering their own program. But one of the things that we have been able to do, and I think this is really successful, um, and again, there's a, we are also blessed to have a singly accredited community college in, in the state of Indiana, uh, Ivy Tech Community College. Last year alone, they had 70,000 students earn college credits. So you can kind of imagine this. They are, they are statewide. They have 19 uh, major main campuses across the state. So what we've been able to do with like our CTE programs that I think is going to help kind of blur these lines between secondary and post-secondary, but then also will help to define what are the competencies that are needed for this particular pathway or this particular pathway is we've been able to directly align to our post-secondary partners programs. And when I say direct, directly align, we have taken 
we, we, we aligned to a technical certificate, which is about 30 college credit hours, and we have just backwards mapped. These are the courses that are required for that post-secondary credential. How do we put them into a secondary model? And just tried to work that way. Um, I, I know, for, as we talk to other states, we realize, okay, that, that's really hard to do. Um, we've been really blessed, like I said. Having Ivy Tech at the table, we only have one other post-secondary partner when we're working with Perkins, being at the cabinet, being under the workforce board. We were able to kind of bring all those pieces together. And our hope is, is that we can use that alignment that we've already created for the programs to very simply say, okay, now all we got to do is map that to a, a specific apprenticeship program. Thank you. And Tony, I would say uh, Ivy Tech is one to watch. You've been watching <laughs> Ivy Tech for, for years. Uh, they, they do some great work yeah. there. But I think for us, um, I think everybody's goal is, is ultimately to see a youth get, get a, a living wageable job, a job. I mean, I yeah. think that's the outcome. Um, I think from the federal standpoint of view, they have federal regulations with WIOA. We, we deal with that. We deal with state regulations. And then we deal with the local regulations as well. And so from our standpoint of view and our vantage point, how do we mesh this? How do we come to conduit to align all of these regulations that's, that's there, right? So that at the end of the, 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 the apprenticeship, we, the, the youth will have a job. Um, yeah. And I think it has to come full circle. When we, when we talk about Perkins, we, we talk about federal funds, and, and, and when, when they, we talk about program support in there, basically looking at what we're doing in North Carolina is we're doing what we call 914 pathways or mm -hmm. 916 pathways. We're, we're trying to start aligning them in the ninth grade and then um, putting them on a pathway that will include a work-based learning component. DPI and NAS working on work-based learning components there for, for high school juniors and seniors as well. Um, and so as they transition into this work-based learning piece, the, the goal would be the transition from that work-based learning mm -hmm. piece into a registered apprenticeship program that would then tap into the community college system to do the related instruction. Um, but I think one missing piece that, that, that we've forgotten there is the employer side. And I heard the employers mm -hmm. talk about this earlier uh, in, their, in their presentation. Um, in North Carolina, we made a push, an intentional effort, to try to incentivize employers that were actually hiring youth apprentices. Um, they, they made a push between the ages of 16 to 24, but of course that 16, 18 age is there. But some of the challenges that we ran into from the employer standpoint of view um, are labor laws. And I know my partner from DOL here uh, know that. But uh, in North Carolina, in, we have a lot of companies, especially in rural counties, that are not hiring um, 16 to 17-year-olds. Um, and so we've tried to figure out ways around that. We, with, with the North Carolina labor laws, it says that if they're in a, a bona fide registered program, they're exempt from the nine hazardous occupations. But mm -hmm. some employers are not bought into that. Um, we see more of this in the, in the urban areas, like in the larger counties, like Mecklenburg County, uh, Greensboro. I was at a ceremony. Catherine and I attended a ceremony this week. Um, a company here in, in, in Greensboro, North Carolina, it's a high precision manufacturing company. They have 280 employees. And, and 80 of their employees are apprentices between the ages of, of 17 and 20, 22. So 25% of their workforce are registered apprentices. It's just impressive yeah. just to see that. Um, and, and they're operating CNC machines. They're programming CNC machines. So, so they, they've actually went on ahead and decided to hire them. But in the rural counties, we see issues with that labor law. Mm -hmm. Um, and and with, with some of the some of the companies are saying no, we're not going to touch them until they're 18, right. until they've graduated high school. So those are some of the challenges that we're working with DOL to try to alleviate and mitigate yeah. uh, to continue pushing youth apprenticeship yeah. programs. No, that's that's a big one, and I will put in a small plug for one of the Pi resources uh, my team supported. Jordan Morang here, uh, one of the analysts on my team, did a fabulous job putting together a state policy playbook to advance youth apprenticeship. And one of the big things we knew we needed to tackle was this exact question: and not only how do you change kind of what the rules and regulations might be, but then actually do some educating about what it really means. And it's really, no, it really is okay. We really do mean it. We're not going to come get you later for it. Um, and I love that each of you started talking about answer, solutions already in my question about challenges. What positivity? And, you know, I think it's such a great motivator. I love it. Um, <laughs> I'd love to kind of dig in a little bit more just for a moment um, on kind of governance structure. Aligning across all these systems requires having a sense of, okay, 
who's going to be in charge, who's going to have the carrots and the sticks, who are the partners going to be, and how are they going to kind of relate to that structure. And Tony, I think you started to kind of talk about that in, in your response as well. So maybe we can start with you just elaborating a little bit on what you see working well about the governance models in your states. And man, I'd love your perspective on your kind of national vantage point on that. Yeah, so uh, again, I mentioned earlier that, so our, our eligible agency is the, the governor's workforce cabinet, serves as our state workforce board. Um, and, and while that, obviously that's, that's a little bit different. Like I said, there's, I think there's two states, there may be a third that is, that is looking at, at kind of moving to that model. And I've shared this a couple of different times that if, when I hired into the office of CTE a little over four years ago, if you would have said, asked me then, well, are you workforce development? I would have said, no, we're, we're, you know, we're K-12 education. We're really focused on that. That's what we're, we're trying to do. Um, that being said, I, I think as like CTE has just exploded, right? It, mm -hmm. it, it's exploded in terms of popularity. It, it's, it certainly is a part of the conversation every time we're talking about this. Um, as we've gotten into it, uh, I, I've shared that we are just kind of at the, at the center point of everything. Um, I, sometimes I think that's because we put ourselves there um, or kind of force our way into that conversation. But we, we serve in, in the intersection between K-12 and, and higher ed. We, we serve in the intersection between uh, industry associations, uh, chambers, workforce boards, and, and actual employers. And I just think that I, I would never try to tell another state, oh, you should move your office of CTE over to the governor's workforce cabinet because, first of all, there's other challenges that come with that. But, um, <laughs> but what I would say is if, you, if, you're, if your CTE programs are not already thinking about that, that positioning, they should be. They need to be because that, that is really um, a, a real challenge for us. We're, we're very fortunate. We, we included, we did a WIOA combined plan. Mm -hmm. So Perkins is, is right in there with all the other WIOA groups. Um, I, I think our challenge is how do we make it more an in integrated part of that combined plan? Mm -hmm. um, so just everything kind of being in, in that place of saying, okay, well, how does this all fit together? And being able to there, there's so many times that I'm able to tell higher ed, well, this is what K-12 is doing, or I'm able to tell a workforce board, well, this is what, you know, the, the local school in your community is already working on. Have you, have you yeah. talked? I, I think that's really key. That connecting this. role. Yeah. yeah, that's huge. Bruce, I'd love it uh, from your perspective, too. Yeah, from uh, within North Carolina, we are the state apprenticeship agency, mm -hmm. and, and again, Catherine is the director over, over the over the apprenticeship NC. Um, we write the programs, mm -hmm. we oversee the programs as well. We're housed under the community college system now. Um, we have a lot of partners that we that we partner with. We have small staff. Um, Catherine has seen kind of a, a, a decrease in her staff from the time she started with apprenticeship to now. Uh, we, we have about 14 field staffers that, that are out there, consultants, coordinators, what we call them, um, four of which are, are, are youth consultants as well. Um, and they're traveling across North Carolina. North Carolina is a big state. Mm -hmm. uh, we have 100 counties, again, 116 LEAs. Um, but one thing that we do know is that our community colleges are touching every LEA. They're, they're in contact with the CTE director. Yeah. They meet with them on a regular basis. So what we try to do is we try to make sure that we engage our community colleges. Uh, when we're talking about registered apprenticeship programs, uh, we're talking about youth apprenticeship programs, we want the community colleges at the table. Uh, we want the employers at the table as well. We have eight prosperity zones, 22 workforce boards, and we work directly with them as well uh, to, to engage the employer. So we're right in the middle as yeah. well. Uh, we kind of make it happen right right there in the, in the middle. Um, but here again, this, it can be a convoluted system sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're working now, like I said, we just joined the community college system at 17. North Carolina has a unique um, policy that I did not talk about, but it's called a tuition waiver uh, for, and it's, it's actually for every high school student that registers into an apprenticeship program or pre-apprenticeship program upon graduation. Uh, and then after they graduate, if they register into a registered apprenticeship program within 120 days of graduation, they get tuition waiver at, at any of the 58 community colleges. So 
if the company chooses to use the colleges as their related instruction, the tuition is waived. Uh, wow. And so that's something that North Carolina has engaged in, again, just to promote youth yeah. apprenticeship as well. So now what we're pushing from my employer's standpoint of view is, hey, we have 58 community colleges, let them do your related instruction. Okay. Uh, utilize them to do your related instruction. That, that's a cost savings on you as far as trying to, trying yeah. to supply uh, tuition as well. So, uh, so we're, we're kind of right in the middle of our system and, and we're working mm -hmm. through it. Um, we're, we're a big state again and, and we have a lot of different programs. We have a lot of different mm -hmm. partners that we work with as well. So. Yeah, no, that's, that's uh, I love hearing both of your examples because, you know, it's definitely set up differently in your states, yeah. but there's the clear kind of common thread of having kind of an entity, a body that is clearly kind of in the driver's seat as that connector, bringing all the necessary kind of people to the table. Um, but it's done in kind of really different ways, and I find that, that really interesting. Um, Manny, I'm curious from your perspective, you know, working in communities across the country, whether it's kind of some of this governance structure we're talking about or other things that you see as being core elements of successfully building greater alignment across systems for youth apprenticeship. Uh, absolutely. So I think actually um, both of our panelists touched upon like the key points. If I had to like, summarize like some quick things that comes to mind, um, you actually touch mm -hmm. up on the, the first thing I was going to say, like, is there a specific organization mm -hmm. that is tasked um, to do this? After we get past that first question, then my second question is, um, who are their partners? Um, and it, it varies across the states. Yeah. So some conveners or backbone organization or sponsors, it could be a state apprenticeship agency. Mm -hmm. um, it could be in our case, it was the, a new office that was created to literally coordinate across all of them. Mm -hmm. It could be the workforce board. Um, a, a workforce board in the area. So it'll look differently mm -hmm. across um, the country, but I think that after you get past the, if there's a specific organization, then the second question is, who are all their partners? So whether it's the community college system, uh, the SAA or state apprenticeship agency, or um, the governor's office or workforce yeah. board, then if, are there missing players? Like one of the things we had saw that we didn't have um, a certain representatives on our board, so we said we need to have those representatives on, on our board. Mm -hmm. Then a final thing I would say is that all of this sounds great. The real yeah. test then, I think a real test I should say is, are they sharing funding? And so yeah. is if we bring all these players together, but I'm still keeping my money here, you're still <laughs> keeping your money here, yeah. then um, I think that's going to be an impediment to the alignment. So one of the examples is, um, uh, we like leveraged leverage our governor's reserve. So mm -hmm. I had in when I was in the, uh, the Nevada, I took I, I was overseeing the governor's reserve funding. So I said we would pay for the, some of the credentials yeah. if they're aligned as we're doing the youth apprenticeship strategy. If they're aligned, vetted by the industry and employers, we'll take some of that money from the governor's reserve and pay for it for um, at the secondary level yeah. and uh, provide some funding to the local boards. And so the other example would be like navigators, right? Mm -hmm. Having a navigator, coordinator, um, those are like really tangible kind of um, ways because when we, one of the things we always hear from employers or industry um, at the federal level or at the state level um, was that they don't know where to go or where to start. Yep. So you yeah. have the organization, you have the clear goals, and then if you're aligned on funding on the processes, who's helping to coordinate? Like, what's the process, right? Yeah. Um, so those would be the kind of the three kind of steps I think through around yeah. the different models that exist across the country. Thank you, and I love that tangible kind of couple of tangible things that you can really do to once you have the right structure in place, really kind of get the good word out there. That's great, Manny. Thank you so much. I want to make sure we have a, few, a little bit of time for some questions from our audience. I know I have plenty more I could ask and chat about. Oh, good. I see someone head to the mic already. Excellent. OK. Um, can you hear me OK? Yes, thank you. OK, so I, I'm going to trip down memory lane here. Um, Ten years ago, I sat kind of where Daphne sat, let's say, in, um, in Denver. I led CTE in Denver. And I sort of founded and led the organization that, that piloted and led to CareerWise. Um, at the time, it felt that our moonshot was how do we how do we make this work really well with higher ed where it's like permeable where it's stackable where an individual you know maybe our own child someday could advance as far as they wanted to and and sort of like now 10 years later I'm like looking at it thinking we haven't really done that yet like systemically at scale we're getting more like one-offs than than anything else and you know we know the value of higher ed and like what that can mean for people and just you know how important that is when I look at the variety of possible solutions here you've touched on your 9 through 14 you know your ascent your um, sort of uh, Bachelor of Applied Sciences just a whole basket of potential solutions here 
Um, I'm curious, like, you know, what, what, how you approach that problem, you know, how you're thinking about, you know, stackability and permeability in the systems that you lead or in many, in your case, nationally, um, and sort of what's promising in terms of getting us to this, this place where higher ed really is more imbued throughout and can lead to advancement. Great question. I can, I can chime yeah. in on it, but um, it's a great question. Just from my standpoint of view, I think, I think you have to be intentional. You have to be intentional about stackable credentials. Um, what we do with the, with the system here is we stack a credential and, and we try to embed a work-based learning piece within that credential because we know that that's going to be the successful piece of that credential itself. So for an example, if you have a high school student that's, that's enrolled in an apprenticeship program and then they roll over into the community college system in that 914 pathway that I talked about, in that first semester their community college is a stackable credential. It may be a certificate but it's a credential that if, if for whatever reason they, they fall out of the program, at least they leave with some type of credential there as well. If they continue in the program, they might get a, a one-year diploma certificate later on. And then, of course, they'll get the associate's degree as well, the applied science. Um, I was at a ceremony Tuesday night. I spoke at an apprenticeship ceremony, of course, for National Apprenticeship Week. We've had them all over North Carolina. Um, and there was a young man there he was uh, he was a youth he started as a youth apprentice he did an internship with the company and then we rolled him into an apprenticeship with the company so he was finishing his four year program uh, in, and as an industrial maintenance technician and so when he when he graduated the other night he had a certificate he had a diploma and he had an associate of applied science he got his journey worker uh, from from the U.S. Department of Labor he got his also apprenticeship certificate from the North Carolina apprenticeship so he left there with five or six credentials. Uh, and that was big for him and his family. And not only that, he's employed with that company as well. So, so when we see those things there, we intentionally try to stack those credentials there, and we're hoping other people will see the, the benefits of doing those things. I would just add a little bit. I, I think, one, I, I feel like we ought to be thanking you for kind of starting this charge 10 years ago. Uh, I, I think it probably, it's like everything else in, in this space. It just doesn't happen as quickly as we, we want it to happen. But I know from, from just kind of my, my relationship with other state CTE directors and also through uh, some other programs like the New Skills Ready Network and, and some of those things, I, I, don't, I don't talk to a state director anymore that, that isn't thinking about how do, we, how do we blur those lines between secondary and K-12? How are we developing these pathways, these career pathways that, that have these stackable credentials that they can start when, you know, they're 16, 17 years old. So, I, like, I, I, could un, I could understand your frustration about, like, how we got there. I, I will tell you that, like, literally every state that I, that I talk to um, is trying to do very similar things. I, I think the one thing that, um, and again, I'm, I'm going to tell you, like, I, I, I've come to understand how blessed we are in Indiana. I think it's the idea of how do you convince the, the people that are having these discussions that now we can go further than that. Like, you know, six college credits is great, but, you know, we, we could do a whole certificate. Mm -hmm. You know, or, or like in our case, we just, and we had something to align to, but the idea that, we can go for a full year. We can come up with 30 credit hours for a student. I love that pushing further. Yeah. Um, and I see we have a couple other questions here. So I want to make sure we get to those. Mary, do you have anything to add to this um, before? I mean, the only just really quick thing is yeah. that it also at the federal level, it requires, and which uh, uh, we're doing, we have a really great relationship with the Department of Education. I think um, um, implicit in uh, your question as well is at the federal level how we are collaborating across. Um, and so we're constantly, we literally meet weekly um, and also think about like how do we also provide guidance to the field um, as it relates to clarifying and providing some of the information. So I know the Department of Education, um, when we meet, they're, they're doing a phenomenal job, one, articulating and sharing to their stakeholders as well and making sure that we're working together to cross over to, with our stakeholders on the language. And then separately, I've seen around articulation agreement, and that's a whole different, like, or related conversation, I think, at the state level, but that's more at the state level, so. Thank you. Wonderful. 
Um, so I have like eight questions. I'm going to try to <laughs> one. Um, Manny, really early on, you, you used a phrase that just really made me think a lot, and that was you talked about that you know people will align themselves based on a measurement, mm -hmm. and and in my experience, that's kind of a double-edged sword. You know, uh, especially in the apprenticeship initiative where so much focus has been around you know just expanding the number of apprentices and and, and growing it this conversation that you all have had has had so much to do with systems alignment mm -hmm. and so i think the question I'm trying to drive out a little bit is what are what's uh, behind that systems alignment that policy alignment what are the what are the impact goals that you see the, the you know your work at the department of labor what are you guys aiming at from an impact standpoint um as opposed to just kind of like a raw number standpoint what what are you what are you trying to tackle from a policy uh angle in that regard yeah, um, just really quickly on the impact, so uh, a great question. Um, on the impact, quite frankly, um, everything drives towards like greater equity. So when we look at these, so when I talk about the unemployment rate, or when, I talk, when we talk about labor force participation rate, um, we don't want to see uh, differences and gaps um, based on race, based on um, uh, age, quite frankly. And so a big part of like our impact is around um, reducing the uh, inequities within the labor market system, right? And so that's the impact piece. And then of course, the, you know, the output pieces, whether we're talking about adding one to two million new apprentices um, um, in, in the next 10 years or so, or the funding, um, whether it's the 300 million we've invested, you'll see that we explicitly put or, or speak to, um, uh, particularly some of those equity um, goals as part of those and as components uh, to be competitive, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that's a great question. But it, it really, for us, is driving around the equity component. Um, like, how do we reduce inequities? So the four million young people we said that's um, um, uh, out of school and not disconnected, or the eight and a half percent unemployment rate, which is a double, almost triple the um, unemployment rate. That's what's driving in terms of the you know big picture impact. What we don't want to see. Thank you. Another question for Manny. Um, you talked about the importance of one door resource. You talked about the importance of having a navigator, um, mm -hmm. and, which I sort of see as a, a fundamental part of one door. And you talked about the importance of consistent language. And I'm wondering if you are aware of, and some of them are probably coming from organizations and people that are in this room, really excellent examples of that, um, of what that looks like tangibly, um, and that is being used effectively um, in terms of navigator, one door navigators using good, clear language that are youth facing, that are employer facing, as well as if there are any, sorry, I'm just lobbing them all at you, um, that, uh, and if there are also sort of like incentives for getting that right so that's a, a variety of pieces of questions, but I'll, I'll, I'll start to say one thing. The first thing is there's, and I think someone in the audience mentioned it or someone on the panel said, we have good examples of pieces. Mm -hmm. um, then the, the challenge is at what scale and um, great examples of, like a, of a part, mm -hmm. but not all of it, right? Mm -hmm. And so like whether it's like, in like the work that, that's happening in Indiana, North Carolina, I can think of South Carolina. Yeah. And so like there's great examples, quite frankly, right? But I think it's like to dive further into your question, I think it depends on like what part, like is it happening, like the examples I think, I think about, they're happening great at like a region or a local. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we're trying to articulate like something, the goal is to actually scale those and make those up broadly. Um, examples of what we're trying to do to incentivize those quite frankly is when we put funding out, <laughs> quite frankly, we're specifically requiring certain kind of partnerships. And so, and we're working across departments through that, whether it's Commerce or Department of Education, we're saying you need to have these partners at the table. Um, separately on the policy side is, um, and I referenced this earlier, we're specifically putting out, whether it's um, leveraging toolkits that already exist, or we're putting out our own kind of language translation around when we say this, here's what it means. So it's putting out those kind of uh, guidance out um, to the field as well. Um, so still a work in progress, but those are the things that come to mind. Um, when you mentioned those uh, questions, which is, you know, yeah. a great question. Oh, a very good question, and I'm, I'm sure our state panelists could elaborate further. I'll briefly just say, I'd love to catch up perhaps after this. There are a couple states that are starting to do more of that at a state level or building on 
work they've already done in all across their K-12 system to have navigators for youth apprenticeship and other opportunities. I'm thinking of Wisconsin as an example, so mm -hmm. I would love to talk more. But Allison, um, I think you'll be our last question. Yay. Um, thank you so much for this panel. I have to say that I think that when I envisioned where this work would be five years ago, the level of systems integration that we're seeing and hearing from today exceeds expectations. So amazing work. And yet um, this amazing work has, I think, revealed new challenges in terms of system integration. Last night we were hearing from some of the youth apprenticeship navigators and coordinators that young people, low income young people are participating. Yay, that's what we wanted. Um, but they are, there are benefit clips for their families that they're beginning to experience, right. that housing, that a young person to accept a high quality, high paying apprenticeship means that their family might lose their housing. And so I'm wondering if you all are seeing any state efforts to deal with, with those kinds of benefits cliffs and or if there are things that we can do as a community to soften the impact for young people and their families. <laughs> it's an important question. It's I think a, the answer yeah. is like yes and no. It is, yeah. The one thing I, I do know that, that we have been able to move forward in, in the state of Indiana, like going back many years, like when I was a, a, like a co-op, a cooperative education coordinator, we would, have, we would have students tell us that, well, no, I can't take a paid job because if I do, that'll, that'll impact the assistance that our family uh, has gotten. I, I do know that whether this is state or, or federal uh, with, with our family and social services, but that, that, that income from that educational experience, that work-based learning experience, no, no longer is, is counted towards that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like, I think that's a huge impact. And again, I, I would have to do some more research to kind of see if there's uh, you know, if that's a state or, or a federal aspect of that. And can I add just really quickly, so your point, um, this is something we also would see with adults. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. a common um, conversation on the adult side too. So I think that while uh, my response is not a direct answer to your question, I would say though that um, two things that stand, comes to mind is that at the federal level, you, I mean, you've, um, you probably have heard like, uh, uh, some of this, which is that we're really pushing on the good jobs initiatives. And the reason why I say that is, although that's, um, uh, what we're saying that is we're not trying to get people to like seven dollars to eight dollars mm -hmm. we're trying to get you to the point where it's actually a more comprehensive in terms of um, actually uh, um, where you could actually sustain even if there is that um, cliff right so it's not going from like you know the difference is meaningful enough um, that it would support so like just strategically thinking about that and then the other piece is um, uh, just an importance of like the whole right now we're talking about youth apprenticeship but really the solutions and really to activate this work, we actually think about the whole family mm -hmm. approach. And so that if we're talking to that youth apprentice, and this is one of my you know, frustrations would be is that everyone should know about the local boards. They should know about all of these components, their community college, because then that youth apprentice is, we could, we could support that family, that mom, mm -hmm. that aunt, uncle, as well as part of the whole system as well. So yeah. it's not a direct answer, but it is, I think, two components that we're thinking strategically about. And I think that is important for people to think about as we have this conversation about youth friendship and specifically to your point around the benefits clip. Yeah, go ahead. And I will add to it, um, I, think, I think the challenge not only is with affordable housing but also with transportation. Um, so we, we've mm -hmm. dealt with that and, and we're seeing counties kind of step up now. Uh, we've had conversations with county commissioners and say, hey, we know that, that housing is, is just, just not aligned with, with this pay scale here or transportation is an issue. And so there's, there are county governors that or county governments that are stepping up now trying to help with that. But, but we're seeing some movement in, on the needle, but not a lot. Uh, but, we, but we are seeing some conversation around transportation and housing right now. Yeah, no, and I'll just, in closing on this question, I think it, it points to an important challenge across the board for Pathways for Youth and for Adults, as Manny said. And quality pathways need to include supports that really address all those non-skill related barriers a person or their family might be facing. And, I've been really excited to be able to support some work through our work at NGA. Someone in the front shout, I think it was you, baby, shout out NGA for this one. Um, thank you. We have started to do some work, uh, really increasing our work, I should say, around sort of benefits clips, non skill barriers to employment and training, and how to kind of integrate that into workforce development and youth employment service delivery. Um, it's really, that's, that's, I think, the next kind of big frontier that our governors and, and community members already starting to face, whether it's solutions that are state funded that involve nonprofits, 
that involve employers as partners, kind of with their own resources in the game to help as well. Um, and I think all this, this whole conversation really shows that, Allison, I'm glad you pointed out that more progress perhaps has been made than might have been expected five years ago. Um, that's something important to remember as we sit here talking about the challenges that remain and the work left to be done. There's definitely plenty of that as well. Um, so just in closing, thank you all for the work you're doing in your communities and, and across the country. And to all of you and to the grantees and others kind of tuning in, um, we really appreciate the work you're doing to push this work forward and look forward to continuing to work on this with all of you. So thank you and thanks to our panelists. So as public and private investment in youth apprenticeship continues to grow, youth apprenticeship program and system leaders are balancing the need for quality with a quest for scale. In this session, philanthropic leaders will discuss how youth apprenticeship advances a wide range of aligned investment priorities and highlight strategies to promote quality, growth, and longevity in the field. And as we've learned, youth apprenticeship falls in the middle of many different areas and systems. And so we have funders who represent education funders, workforce funders, and business funders. So our panelists today include Issa Ellis, a senior program officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, focused on increasing access to education and employment pathways that lead to upward mobility for black and Latino young people and those experiencing poverty. Prior to joining the Gates Foundation, Issa was national vice president at the Boys and Girls Club of America, launching the organization's first national post-secondary and workforce development strategy. Issa's more than 15 years in education includes brokering partnerships between the education, corporate, governmental, NGO, and philanthropic sectors to increase access and funding for underserved youth. We also have Allison Gerber, Director of Employment, Education, and Training at the Annie E. Casey Foundation. There, she oversees the foundation's investments in employment and career-focused education and training. Her work focuses on promoting collaborative approaches to improving employment opportunities for low-income families. Prior to joining the foundation, Gerber was the Executive Director of the District of Columbia's Workforce Investment Council and a Senior Associate with the Aspen Institute's Workforce Strategies Initiative. We're also joined by David Etzweiler, the Chief Executive Officer of the Siemens Foundation. Under David's leadership, the foundation has focused its efforts in three areas, advancing workforce training, reducing health disparities, and creating a more sustainable world. David's leadership has frequently been at the intersection of business, government, and philanthropy. Prior to the Siemens Foundation, he spent 13 years with Medtronic, Inc. In that role, he aligned the foundation's philanthropy with the company's global business strategy, building value for both organizations and society, which is important because we frequently talk about how youth apprenticeship is a win for both communities and employers and the apprentices themselves. So moderating this panel is Kevin Carey, the Vice President for Education Policy and Knowledge Management here at New America, where he directs the education policy program. He's a frequent writer on education-related topics, including articles for the New York Times, Washington Post Magazine, Vox, Wired, and many more. So with that, I will turn it over to our moderator for our final panel of the day. Thanks, Kelly. Um, and thanks so much to all of you for coming to our home here at New America. Some of you traveling uh, great distances. It's just such a pleasure to be all together um, to uh, uh, see some old faces and meet some new ones. Um, we just couldn't be happier uh, for all of this. And we're very pleased to have um, our panelists here. Um, I'm going to start the conversation um, with a question for Allison and David. Um, so your two foundations were two of the original funders of the PI initiative. Without you, I don't think we would all be here. Uh, you know, philanthropists have lots of choices to make about how to invest your funds. Um, what was it about youth apprenticeship that led you to support the initiative in the beginning? Uh, and what have you learned along the way? I'm going to kick that one off. Great. Thank you, Kevin. And great to be here um, with everybody. It's been nice to spend time um, with a lot of folks who are really getting the work done um, the last couple of days. So um, kudos to all of you. Um, if we go back to, for us at the Siemens Foundation about nine years, um, Kevin, we, we um, 
had a sense that we were being strategic, but we didn't think we were sort of getting the highest return on investment for society, right? So there was this conversation about what does that mean, and we really landed on a framework that looked at what are the big issues of the day, and in that one of the issues that was there was income and wealth uh, disparities, racial inequalities, uh, the understanding that as an economy we had certain jobs that were going unfilled, um, and that we all needed that, um, right, to, to, to prosper. So, so there was sort of this inequity um, bubble there. We looked at where the foundation had traditionally been, which was in youth and STEM education, and so some expertise networks there. But then we swung over to the assets of the company and said, yes, as a foundation, we have financial assets, but what are the assets that we can leverage on behalf of a society um, that are out there? And we've got a German parent. Um, <laughs> in Germany, we train literally thousands of apprentices a year. It's a very different culture, as everybody in the room knows there, in terms of um, what that looks like. But we really saw a tremendous opportunity there to serve society and to really begin to chip away at um, not only the, the inequity, but also um, to be able to rebuild um, some of the institutions that had been hacked away um, in our democracy, right? And I think that's a lot of what the rep is represented in, in the work here. The kind of the why, the why youth apprenticeship piece, we landed on you know, 16 to 29 year olds and really saw the greatest opportunity within workforce development. Um, to, to serve youth, <clears throat> particularly disadvantaged youth? Um, well, the Casey Foundation is really at the table because the Siemens Foundation invited us. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I think Crystal Bridgman's That's not funny. here today, but Crystal reached out and you know, said, I really want you to come to this conversation with New America and, and begin to engage in youth apprenticeship. And I said, you know, we're not really true believers in the apprenticeship model. Like, mm -hmm. it's, it, we do fund some apprenticeship and it's great, but we're, we're really more interested you know, in equitable opportunities for low, young people from low-income families to grow careers. We're interested in trying to get the schools to partner better with business. You know, we're, we're interested in these systems things. And Crystal was like, no, that's why I'm inviting you. <laughs> and so I think we, we kind of made an assumption based on uh, the Siemens origin story that it was really about apprenticeship as the model. And I think really, um, found a table that shared our values around mm. equitable opportunities for young people of color, around you know, making college more affordable and dealing with that, the, the nut of debt, of college debt, and how much it was holding back opportunity, of thinking about um, how do we get companies more engaged long term in conversations with schools instead of just saying, they're not producing what I want, I'm not hiring, you know, like mm. co-opt them into the system. Um, you know, how do, we, how do we think about creating more spaces of belonging at work for young people of color? How do we, you know, it was all of these things that we saw, you know, in the youth apprenticeship approach. And it really was, if you think about that, graph, that graphic that Taylor showed today that kind of showed program, for us it was, yes, system and really culture. And, and that was our interest. Um, and so flash forward, I think the second part of your question is like, what have we learned or what have we seen? Um, you know, earlier this week, I looked at the, I guess it was um, Joseph Fuller and the folks at Harvard did some analysis of the career-wise data, and I was like, you know, looking, piecing to the end, to the end, to the end, what are the, the <clears throat> outcomes of this? And to see that young, young people from low-income families are realizing opportunities, to see that um, we're, we're seeing, like, more diversity, and to see that in the PIA data, yeah. like, I think we've learned it's possible, yeah. right? We've learned that really, like, quality program models can drive systems change. And that's tremendous. Thank you. Um, Issa, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, world's largest <laughs> foundation, now also joining this movement, um, you know, began as a foundation focused on global health and education. It's been in education for a long time, but now um, have developed this uh, focus on pathways. What brought the foundation to this point? Tell us a little bit about the strategy. Yeah, so uh, we are the newest, I would say one of the newest funders in this work. So we've only been investing in pathways specifically for four and a half years. Um, and it was for a couple of different reasons. So one, it was really around, we have this K-12 strategy that we've had, um, a K-12 team that we've had for 20 years. We have a post-secondary team. They're very much focused on completion, very much focused on college readiness. Um, and then, you know, our post-secondary team very much focused on enrollment, 
persistence and completion, but neither was focused on labor market outcomes. And knowing that that's something that we needed to lean into, also realized that we had two separate strategies and we needed to connect the dots, right? And so we had two individual teams that talked to each other every now and then, but weren't really intentional around how to build a coherent strategy. And so part of our work um, as a Pathways team was like, how do we connect the dots between the two strategies? How do we help young people specifically during critical transition points in their life for, and for too many young people, especially those who've been historically and systemically marginalized, unfortunately, incredibly consequential, right? And so how do we help them make really inform good decisions in service of um, attaining the credentials, the skills, the social capital, um, and the agency they need <clears throat> in order to launch careers that can put them on a path to economic opportunity and mobility. And so the Pathways team was created to help answer that question, to say, one, how can we connect the dots? How can we support young people along those critical transition points? But then what are also some of the blind spots? So we spent a lot of time <laughs> talking to our peers, <laughs> um, other funders in this work, to understand what they've been investing in, what, what's worked, what hadn't worked, what are some of the lessons learned, and then where could we add value? And that was the biggest thing that we did the first year was really lean into, I mean, Casey's been investing, Carnegie's been ex investing, Bloomberg, well, all these organizations, Strata, Lumen, you just name it. But yet here we come to the table and we're like, we don't know what value we can add. So we spent a lot of time just figuring out what's been done and then how we can lean in. So that's how we got into this work. So we didn't start, um, participating in a PIA community until about maybe a year ago, maybe almost 18 months. Um, and that's only because um, the New America team was incredibly gracious in terms of letting us learn before we invested. And that's just because we didn't know what value we would add, right? And so Crystal Bridgman was also the person <laughs> who invited us to join this community. And um, everything she said makes sense, but we were like, well, what are we, like, what's the value of adding another funder? other than adding additional resources. And so the fact that we were able to ride along for about two years and then over the last year, year and a half, say, oh, I think we can add value in this very specific way, um, that's when we decided to engage. Gracious and persistent. persistent. <laughs> yes, yes, persistent. Um, David, I want to come back to something you said at the beginning. You talked about how uh, the Siemens cor corporate parents <coughs> base in Europe um, a, a very different, perhaps much more extensive history yeah. with apprenticeship. And this is something that comes up sometimes. People will say, well, of course it works there, but that's there and we're here and they're not yeah. the same. What are the real differences? Uh, and what are the differences that people think are real, but actually aren't and that we can overcome? Yeah, what, what are, that's a, a wonderful question. I, I mean, I, I, the, the first thing that comes to mind for me in terms of the differences, um, a lot of folks in the room have been to Switzerland, have toured Germany and seeing this in action and you know what you realize from the beginning is that you're not constantly telling the story right like those of us who work in this you know you're at a dinner party whatever you're holding a beer and, and so, what, what are you working on and apprenticeship you know kind of reluctantly comes out of your mouth what's that right you're starting from the beginning there a sizable portion of the of the population has been an apprentice it definitely has an apprentice in the family, in the workplace, et cetera. So there's a quick abbreviation of belief in it. Um, and so it's part of the culture. And part of the culture also means that it's already woven um, with business, with labor, with educational institutions, all playing their role. And it's not that there aren't tensions there, mm -hmm. but by and large, they know they're going to you know, succeed about um, and, and push forward with that. And the final difference I would put out there, um, or the fi final note, um, I would put out there about um, uh, the apprentices is, you know, as we come back to the U.S. Um, and try to have this conversation, right, this has just been a, a challenge for us. If we're really candid about this at Siemens, right? Our businesses are, and this is the fastest growing, the largest and fastest growing business is here in the U.S. for Siemens. We are challenged to have these picked up as quickly as we would like them to be in our business. That's not my role. Um, and that's not what we pushed in the foundation. We're here for society. Um, but we recognize the challenges that exist in society. Mm -hmm. um, and that's part of the beauty of PI, right? Is this, this is actually a huge systems change um, operation that's happening here. Keep it quiet. Um, but it's been <laughs> deconstructed and there are fingerprints all over it from funders and from providers. And that's uh, kind of a beautiful thing to start to build. Mm -hmm. um, 
Allison, the Casey Foundation, I think, is very well known as an organization that really centers equity in its identity and its mission and its purpose. I wonder if you could expand a little bit about how you see this work and that agenda fitting together. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to. Um, and I'm glad that we're well known for that. I feel like um, when we started you know, down this road a while ago, we were you know, kind of, that was a part of our identity that people were trying to avoid <laughs> um, and that we were constantly bringing into the room. And, um, but I think, you know, when we just, when we look at the labor market, it's so stratified by race, right? It's not just stratified by income or by gender, but race underpins so much of it. And when you look at, you know, um, Manny talked a little bit about the youth unemployment rates and, and how they are, you know, double or triple. But when you look at black unemployment rates, you know, they also double our national average in any time, good or bad. Um, when you look at, and when you look at how that happens over time, you know, it's not just that we pay people of color less, it's that people of color get, end up in jobs where generation over generation, it's less valued, right? And so we're really like, <laughs> these are impossible hundreds of years trends that we're trying to chip away at. And so trying to find solutions that do that, I think is, is at the heart of what we've been doing. Um, and I think, you know, we kind of, we have a perspective on it that's like you start with the data, you start with the community, you understand what people want. And I think we really did that as a part of the PIA process. Um, but we also have kind of a perspective that at the end of the day, what you're trying to create is belonging, right? Like what we want is for young people of color not just to make more money or to buck occupational segregation. <clears throat> we want them to come into workplaces and belong. Like what we all want at work, right? And for that not to feel uncomfortable or unlikely or unreal, but, but to really belong. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like what we're starting to see. Mm -hmm. You know, we're starting, um, we had a young person come and speak to our board, a young apprentice from North Carolina, um, Philip Fuller. He's amazing. And he <coughs> talked to our board about what it was like to be a young black man inside a company of white men and what it was like to become a manager of like all white teams and how supported he was in that role. That's amazing. Like that doesn't happen in America, right? That is not a usual story. And so to the degree that this effort really kind of continues to perpetuate experiences like that, I think it's, it's taking our equity work to a, a different level. You so said the Gates Foundation, in addition to being enormous, is a longtime investor in education reform. Um, started with high schools, has never, <laughs> never lost its focus on secondary education. I think sometimes there's a concern that there's a an unacceptable trade-off between preparing people for careers and a focus on academic excellence. From your perspective, I know that's not a belief we share, but can you talk about from the foundation's perspective how we put those two things together? Yeah, so we, when we think of quality pathways, right, we think there's intentional, structured coursework and um, experiences that young people are having um, really starting in middle school, and if not earlier, right, leading into high school, then transitioning into post-secondary. And so, um, and we say post-secondary just to be really clear, knowing that most jobs require a post-secondary credential, right? But we're not saying necessarily four-year, we're saying post-secondary. Um, I would say the way we think about it is that all young people, and this is what's so interesting about apprenticeships that we did not fully understand initially, we didn't learn until like, you know, just a couple years down the line because I'll be honest, like our, our um, idea of apprenticeship was just around, it's only for specific jobs, it's only for specific career paths, um, and therefore there we go again, putting young people, especially young people of color, down this path that's like an alternative pathway. Like what's different now with all like apprenticeships that's different from before. So we had to wrap our head around understanding apprenticeships as it is right now, not a, a, apprenticeships as they were, right? And so we had to wrap our head around that. And one of the things that um, gets us excited about apprenticeships, and I will say our partners um, career-wise and um, 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 Here to Here, which has career-wise New York, and now in CityWorks DC has like career-wise DC, like these organizations helped us understand that not only are they providing um, quality work-based learning experiences, <coughs> Um, but through those experiences, there's intentional coursework that's braided in, right? So they're having these experiences in a classroom, they're having these experiences on a job, but they're fully integrated experiences. Mm -hmm. And then the supports that they're receiving, advising support, mentoring support, social capital development, like they're actually meeting folks who are invested in who they are and want to um, develop these long-term relationships with these young people. For us, 
that's how we think about like what is career connected learning and what does it mean to have a braided and integrated learning experience that just doesn't include coursework but it's a it includes what are the experiential opportunities that are afforded to young people and all young people should have access to them so that's how we think about it in in our work so we think much more expansively than you know you get up every day you're in your high school classroom sitting in a seat right um, for six hours or whatever a day and then you leave for like that's the, and then maybe you have an after school job like it's what does that six hours look like and how is it integrated and so what we support and what we invest in is specifically those organizations specifically intermediaries which have come up a lot in, in the conversation over the day those organizations that have successfully made the case and have created programs that integrate work and learn that's a, that makes so much sense thank you um i know we have a pretty uh, uh quick agenda and i want to make sure we have time for questions from the audience are we at question time not the kind where they yell at you like in the uk but <laughs> good, good question time. it's okay so please Oh, let's go to questions. Yeah. I've got another one, I guess. Um, I'm curious how, as funders, you have thought or, or may think potentially in the future about using impact investments, um, PRI, MRI in this space, um, so as to potentially even move the goalposts away from where they're currently at, um, particularly as you bring higher ed into the mix around apprenticeship and whatnot, you've got really low completion rates for full-time students, like 10%, 15%, sometimes at best in, in some states. So you know, using those financial instruments as a tool to maybe um, fuel the growth of stuff like this, I'm curious if that's crossed your mind, if you see anything promising in that area. I, I can share, I can get us started. We're not there yet. So we've started to um, talk about it because a number of the organizations that we face entered the space as nonprofit organizations um, that are starting to think about other forms of revenue, right? So what's the for-profit side of their work? Um, and so even though we have a PRI team, we don't actually partner with them yet, um, but we're trying to figure out in what ways we can because a lot of these organizations are waiting, waiting for philanthropic dollars and public dollars. Um, to support the, their work and sometimes those dollars take a long time to come in and they need act, like active working capital um, that they can leverage in support of their work. So we're not there yet, but we're in talks um, with some folks trying to figure out like how we can support in that way. And I will also say we're big on partnerships. So what we don't fund because um, we're limited in an investment vehicles that we leverage at this time, we look for other funders who do have other vehicles that they can leverage and then see we can provide the philanthropic dollars how can you provide the more like impact investing dollars um I, I work with our social investments teams on a number of things not related to this work much more around like entrepreneurship um, businesses that are part of their model produce a profit i i think i have some hesitation and maybe it's related to you we're not there yet like, I, I very much hear you on the driving outcomes, but when we're talking about community and technical colleges and outcomes, we're talking about K-12, like, part of the inherent challenge of not reaching the outcomes is the deep inequities in the funding formulas and how much worse they've gotten over the last 20 years. And so, to like, for the foundation to create a funding vehicle where we would peel 3% off the top as a return on investment feels not mission aligned. Um, at this point, like I, th I think I would be much more interested in trying to figure out how we incent business capital to invest in apprenticeship in, in a way that would lead to matching and that would, you know, allow educational institutions to keep more of their dollars. Um, that I think would be a better fit for us in terms of our equity mission. Yeah. Hi everyone. It's all for me. Um, as funders, this is kind of a twofold question, and you may not have the answer to it. Um, but how have you all, and if so, how are you having intentional conversations with your partners around pay equity for students? <coughs> pay equity. I mean, I can start. I, so I think um, <clears throat> I. I I don't see my role as much around having conversations about um, pay equity. I see my role as supporting the PIA network to have the resources, school skills, abilities, tools 
to have those relationships with their employer partners and to have those tough conversations about pay equity. Like, I think those of you who, who are directly talking to an employer about the tremendous asset that is a young person is best positioned to say, and this young person deserves to receive this, right? As opposed to me um, having that direct conversation. Now that said, I think a second part of our role is to look at what is being learned across all kinds of engagements with employers around equity and then put that into spaces where other employers can learn and benefit from it. So to thinking about like, what can we bring to the chamber? What can we bring to institutions like Just Capital who are like ranking employers on their equitable practices to, to really incent equity and, and to create some, some kind of connective tissue or some, some protective um, factors around based on the things that we see working, right? And I would say pay is a huge part of it, but I think benefits, all, all of the pieces, right, that make young people fully compensated for their labor. Thanks so much for taking the leap and uh, believing in this network as a grantee. It has been invaluable to us, so just thank you for that. My question is a bit back to Allison, what you were describing at the top of this panel when you were saying, hey, we wanted to see the programs, but programs lead to systems change. And so I would love to hear from this group, how are you starting to think about even evolving some of how you're funding this work to think about what systems change has to look like? And I bring that up because we sit in Indiana kind of at the intersection of trying to help start and scale programs, but also working deeply with our state partners and the folks you know, who, are, who create the system and can change the system. And it, it sort of requires a different set of relationships and tools and techniques and time to really make that happen. And so we're here to learn about that. You guys have invested in programs. And I'm just curious how you're starting to think about the next gen of this as it relates to systems change. Mm -hmm. I, can take, I can take a stab. I should say I'm probably. Um, the furthest from day-to-day -day implementation of the folks on the panel here, but I will say that one of the things that we loved from the beginning about the work that Pi was doing was, yeah, this was big, you know, systems change work, but looking at the policy side of this was really important and in the conversations that we had leading up to this, but also um, the ones that I've had in the hallway here the last couple of days too, there's a recognition that there are some very decentralized policy conversations going on now, right? Pulling states together where, hey, Alabama actually has a really great law here that, that permits you know, certain apprentices to do X, Y, and Z, but, but the state doesn't. How do we you know, share best practices? How do we begin to bring together legislation um, that cuts across all 50 states, right? So those are the kinds of opportunities that I think um, this really decentralized approach um, is really helpful. And, and for me, just coming to this conference, we used to talk about systems change all the time, right? Funders talk about that all the time, right? <laughs> um, yeah. And we actually don't, I don't think we talk about it that way that much just because the work is being done and you all who are closest to the action and see what the needs are, are able to contact the PIA folks here, contact each other, and it's just kind of a, a, a mutual support system, I think, that is changing things one at a time. So that, from a bottoms up approach, yeah. I think that's where I see the most, um, the most movement. Yeah. I, can, I can add, I think, along with the coordination, right, which mm -hmm. many organizations have elevated to us, there's, better, you know, there's a necessity for better coordination um, across agencies, right, labor, education, commerce coming together, together. Everyone is putting out individual grants and having folks apply to them, right? But how can they come together and being very intentional around how they deploy funds and public dollars, federal dollars? And then at the state level, how do those agencies come together? And I think that's where we can be helpful in supporting that coordination, but where I also see um, where we can support, where I feel PIA has really stepped up is really um, just the definition, right? And that came yes. up in an early conversation, right? Like, what is youth apprenticeship? What does that even mean, right? And so putting <clears throat> forth a point of view and being very consistent in that also helps to not only help people understand, but shift the narrative around apprenticeship, yeah. right? And what does that mean? So I've seen um, a lot of work around that, and Paya has actually led the way around that work um, very specifically. I would also say I think um, where there's real opportunity is for us to really think um, this more strategically in terms of the systems change piece is not just how agencies come together and how dollars are deployed, but deployed to whom, right? So you have a lot of organizations that are doing this work that sit outside of systems but act, serving as system actors and coordinators, but they cannot access those dollars directly, right? So they have to work through their K-12 um, partner or their higher ed partner, even through their employer partner. So 
I, like one of the things I know many of us are thinking through are like how do we set up pathway intermediaries to be able to access um, federal dollars directly, right, and state dollars directly in service to the work that they're doing. So there's a financing piece, there's a, coordinate, there's a coordination piece, there's a um, narrative piece, um, but I think starting with what, what's happened with this network is the definitions piece. Um, I think that's helped a lot in moving the conversation forward. I want to say thank you to you all. This was a really great panel, and thank you for your investment in this work. A few of you have mentioned, actually all of you have mentioned equity, and as we know, equity is a big, broad term. Um, and so I'm curious about any outcomes that you're excited about or that you've seen preliminarily within this space, knowing that apprenticeships is new or rather redefined, to your point, Issa, if there are any outcomes that are especially um, exciting or curious that you all can share with this group as we're thinking about really making sure that equity is at the core of um, these initiatives? Hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I have some thoughts. <laughs> well, I will say that we are still, like in full transparency, we are still trying to understand, like, uh, what are we even measuring, right? Because we've been very much focused on, like, outputs Right, so how many young people serve, by whom, what, you know, what employers, um, are these equity-centered employers? Um, so there's a lot of work right now to really get clear on what are quality metrics, right? Um, and many, you know, folks in this room, but also thinking about like, what are PW metrics, I mean, what are P20 <coughs> metrics, I mean. Um, so there's a, lot to, yeah. there's a lot to figure out. I mean, one of the things I know that matters to us, and we're trying to figure out, we're just not there yet, there's, there, are the, there are the localized outcomes, right, that many of our partners are looking at, which is still very output-based, right? Um, but we are not yet capturing longitudinal data to really see, like, the, lo like the long-term impact of a lot of these programs, and that's just because the data systems aren't set up that way, right? The infrastructure isn't there. There's a lot of data, but folks aren't necessarily talking to each other, and everyone has alum but not everyone has the, the capacity to manage their alumni base to capture that data in terms of, okay, we help you get that first really great quality job, right? But, um, and hopefully the intent across the board is full-time, right? Not contractual jobs, but full-time jobs that come with um, benefits. But are you being retained? And for how long are you being retained, right? Are there promotional opportunities? What are the wages that come with that? Do you still have a sense of belonging? So past the initial hiring manager that think you're fabulous and I want to have you on board because you're just great, fabulous youth apprentice, what about the next level of you know, management? And then what's the continuing education support that you're getting from your employer? These things are not different from a, like a, adult employment, right? Um, and those are a lot of, we're still figuring a lot of that, a lot of those things out. But I would say we're still figuring that out because a lot of the things that I would say they're mostly output measures. Like we don't have a lot of outcomes. I don't know if you all yeah. have any outcome measures that you're looking at now or have access to. Um, well, I can say like we, I, uh, plus one to everything that you just said. And I think we struggle with this internally. And I, like if I were to say like what is the thing we would want, how would we define equity and our impact, it would be around the racial wealth gap, right? Mm -hmm. Like that is ultimately what we would want. Now, there are a lot of points from here to there that we don't necessarily have data around, and that is like the joy and the pain of youth apprenticeship and the length of time we're gonna hold on to young people. It's so great that we're gonna do that and make that kind of investment and ask others to make that investment. It also means it's gonna be a while. Um, like I think there was the conversation up here like in 14 years, in 24 years. And so um, I think hoping that some of the things that we're starting to see around lowering the cost of education and thinking about competitive wages and that would be contributors. But, but I also think, and I know I give Taylor heartburn when I say this, the time has come that we have to start to a little bit begin to shape an evaluation agenda so that in 24 years we, we can know. Um, and, but it would be the racial wealth gap at the end of the day, which. So I'll do the <laughs> plus two piece. Um, and, and, and be brief in my comments, but I'd say, I mean, the first thing I think of is what Taylor presented earlier this morning, right, in terms of who's getting apprenticeships versus, you know, who's in, who's in the job market right now, right? Mm -hmm. That tells us we have some issues to address and better understand with certain populations, but we're doing really well um, with other ones, right? But they're indicators, to your point, right? These are early indicators, but they're strong indicators, too, 
right? This is for my job in a business setting <laughs> is always challenging with my business partners, right? Because yeah. they're used to a correlation that's kind of a one to one. Yeah. And yeah. we're risk capital and we're in a policy atmosphere. But the indicators that come out of there, when you think about that pie chart was such a beautiful thing. When you think about those populations getting up, you know, and then pairing that with our guests this morning, the apprenticeship, the apprentices, no debt or little debt probably, um, and income coming in and skills that are tangible and hope, right? A belief that I belong in the system and I can, uh, I can achieve, I'm being celebrated, um, gives me a lot of optimism for the future. And yes, I think we all agree that get, nailing down those outcomes going forward too, longitudinal, what did that mean in terms of your debt over time? What did that mean to your family? What did that mean to your overall salary, et cetera? Are all things that will be captured and need to be captured going forward as well. Uh, I think Issa made a great point about management, right? The thing about pathways is they continue. Right. And, and they can go in different directions. And, and the way they go should influence how we think about the new generations as they come along and as the, the youth we focus on today aren't youth, but are still people who are very invested in and right. still people who, um, particularly when we think about the wealth gap, that's the wealth accumulating part of your life, right? You're yes, not, you're absolutely. not, and so um, where you end up is gonna make a huge difference for the next generation and for so on. <clears throat> um, next question, please. Yes, sir. Uh-oh. No, 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 <laughs> um, we talked, you talked about the importance of partnerships amongst funders and, and some of the ways, again, shout out to Crystal Bridgman for bringing a lot of the funders to this community. Uh, can you just share a few more things that you're excited about from the vantage point of funders, right? As funders, we get to see things from the 30,000-foot perspective. What are some of the things that we've heard a lot today? Uh, um, but just from your perspective, what are you super excited about? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> I can jump. I'll, yeah. I'll say two things right off the bat. I'll keep them short. I mean, one is I would say, and, and you know, maybe this is kind of typical fun. I really like that the walls are down in this relationship, right? The, the, the funders and the, provide, the folks that are getting the work done, it, easy for me to say, but it feels to me like egos and reputations and logos mm -hmm. have been checked and that people are focused on the vision. And I hope I've got that right, but that's, that's what it feels like, number one. So I'm excited about that. And then I'm just excited in the general economy as well of what's coming in terms of infrastructure, in terms of the Inflation Reduction Act, in terms of the CHIPS Act, and I'm, and I'm motivated, right, to make sure that the folks that we're focused on today have at least an equal shot and participation in that. But th this is huge, and this, you know, inclusive green jobs is something that we're excited about um, and look forward to playing a role in. <laughs> um, I want to say plus one. I, I'll say plus one, and yeah. maybe I'll, I'll add a little like texture to your your one. I I think that that I have I really what I've enjoyed about this work is that we've hung together so mm -hmm. so long as funders, and that um, that we we're intentional about not making it a brand, but and intentional about like that that would be bad for the field if if there was the Bill, Melinda Gates Foundation apprenticeship and there was the Siemens, you know, like that's just yeah. crazy making, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's, I've really enjoyed that and enjoyed, you know, like adding folks, adding you, Farhad, and, you know, mm -hmm. look forward to who's coming next. Yeah. But at the same time, I think what's tricky now is that this is a whole network. And so we used to be like a table of folks who would sit in that room over there and talk, right? And so now it, it isn't, I look forward, I think, to having those same levels of ownership, like up mm -hmm. and down and across this network and figuring out what that looks like, especially now that we can be out in the world together and not on the, the little boxes. Because I, I think that's like where we're gonna start to realize this movement building that we wanna see, and, and so that'll be fun. I agree, I plus two, and I would say there are funders across the board that are focused on, there are funders who are focused on solutions. Let, let me dig into apprenticeship, let me dig into advising, you know, let me dig into dual enrollment. Then you have those funders who are focused on um, data infrastructure, and narratives, and policy, and then you have those that are focused on those like, you know, coordinating entities like intermediaries, and we're all talking to each other, right, and trying to figure out how together we can fund this work to make greater impact, which is really great. And we're not saying, in some cases, we're like, well, let's double down on these things, but at the same time, we're saying, well, you know, if that's, if policy is your thing, then how can we put money into that, but let, lean into you to dig into the policy? So we're leaning into each other's strengths, 
as funders um, in ways that maybe that funders haven't showed up in the past. So I think um, that's one of the things. And the other thing I just have to say is that we, I think, are starting to amplify each other's investments. So it's not, again, individual funder investments. Like we're saying, you know, this funder um, is investing in something that we're not, and we're just like, yes, let's spotlight them. Let's make sure everyone knows about them. Or if we're, you know, funding an organization or a particular solution, and we're just, and folks are like, yeah, how can I amplify them via my platform? You know, whether it's social media or whether it's convenings and conferences. So we're creating space to highlight each other's work and to amplify each other's um, investments. And I think that's really exciting, the way that we've come together and we're partnering and um, just even supporting each other as a funder community. All right, we are at time. Please join me in thanking our panelists. That was a terrific discussion. I'm Mary Alice McCarthy, and I'm a senior director here at New America and oversee the Center on Education and Labor. Um, so for anyone who I haven't met yet, hello, and thank you so much for coming here. What a fantastic day. Yep, hello again, <laughs> yes. What a fantastic day, and uh, oh my gosh, I know. Like, it's, um, it brings me back to like how uh, uh, all of our uh, apprenticeship meetings, our PIA meetings, always just leave me feeling so energized and so optimistic about the future. And it used to be that that was really just sort of kind of a like, yeah, maybe, maybe this will happen. And I feel like the theme of today is like, it's happening, people. We have momentum. There is movement, right? So as of today, I think we can officially say phase three of PIA uh, is underway, and we are in it. This train is moving, um, and more and more people are getting on it. And that is just incredibly exciting. I do want to just, um, just quickly, just like, three quick themes that I just saw really come out today uh, in, in the course of the conversation. Again, the first one is this, um, just the fact that there is movement. Yes, we've been kind of having some of the same conversations for many years now, but obviously, as somebody pointed out, this is part of what the work is. We're having the same conversation, but there is tangible steps towards success. We have more youth apprentices than we used to. We have greater alignment across K-12 and uh, higher education in many places, not what we want it to be. We have greater understanding of what apprenticeship is, what youth apprenticeship is, and what it could be. Um, so I do think we are seeing that. Another point that I just thought was so well put uh, and that just so captured really what we all, I think, are doing, uh, what our work is, was made by uh, Michelle Marie from uh, M&T Bank from Buffalo, who talked about this experience of like being in her bank or being in her, uh, her place of business and trying to get the thing started and, you know, and, and, and talking to managers and talking to hiring managers about what their needs are. And everyone would start with like, well, a bachelor's degree or maybe a master's degree. And then that question of like, but is there someplace else where people could start? Like, what could be a starting point? And, you know, when I think about what, what has happened in this country for young people over the last several decades, is that we keep moving the starting point of their adult working lives later and later and later, and they have to complete more and more things, and they and their families have to spend more and more money just to even get started. And what we're doing with PIA, with the part, with youth, youth Apprenticeship, is we're taking those goalposts and we're moving them back to young people. And we're saying, you can start here. You don't have to have finished college to actually start getting a really good paid job and professional work experience. And it is long overdue. We've been moving the goalposts away from young people for a long time now. This community is moving those goalposts back, and I think it's really exciting. And I think we can see what it looks like to move those goalposts back when we saw those two youth apprentices. Weren't they amazing? They're always the best part of any, any PIA meeting, any meeting on apprenticeship. It's why we should do them more often, just because you know, they are so exciting. But I mean, these two young women, were they confident? I mean, confident young women. And they were confident about their futures. And one of the sentences, or one of the lines out of, that both of them talked about, too, is just what it means to be managing your own money at 17 or 18 years old and paying your own way. And boy, I'll tell you. The younger you internalize the joy of that particular experience, the better, right? And if it doesn't happen till 26, there's a good chance, you know, that, 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 that there's a lot of debt behind you that you're about to own, too. So, um, so I just thought, again, we, just, we saw what it looks like when, when, we, when we give young people, when we move those goalposts to them, let them get started, how it builds their confidence, how it builds their agency. Um, 
And then the last point is just about the slide that Taylor had about culture change, right? right? We, are, we are seeing momentum, right? And we're, we're moving forward and it's gonna take a lot more programs and a lot more youth apprentices and a lot more stuff happening on the ground. But we've also can use that as a foundation for this culture change and this transformational change and this systems change that we're all talking about. We can't do the systems change and the culture change without the stuff happening on the ground. But we also need to make sure that we leverage what's happening on the ground really make lift it up make the most of it and translate it into a much broader change agenda and that is going to take a network to do that nobody can do on their own that takes a whole community that takes people all across the country people and all sorts of different tables talking about youth apprenticeship and kind of singing from the same songbook even if not saying exactly the same thing so thank you for being our partners in doing that I have never been more excited about the future of youth apprenticeship and just the future of our ability to change the conversation, change the narrative about what young people need in this country and make it much more friendly to, to what their actual needs are and what they're telling us they actually need. So with that, I'm gonna start with some thank yous um, and, um, and then hand, uh, hand over the mic to, uh, to Taylor, uh, our national director of PIA. I, but before I leave, I will just say a gigantic thank you to our funders and in particular on that panel. I mean, thank you all for working together it is so helpful to us. It is just, it is such a shot in the arm to be able to sort of have a, same, a, a conversation across multiple funders about, about what we're doing. So that's super helpful. Uh, thank you to all of our partners um, and a big shout out to Andrea uh, uh, Messings Matthews, whose birthday it actually is today. So she shares a birthday with Paya and that <laughs> is a good thing to be. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. And then, of course, thanks to uh, our New America events team, and most importantly, thanks to Team Paya. And Taylor, why don't you come on up and, and close us out here? So um, I, was, I wasn't actually originally slated to give the thank you here, um, but felt like to close out the day, I really wanted to make sure that we expressed our thanks. And I was laughing over there looking at the podium, thinking one of the many things that we didn't write is how to move it. And we're like, you know, the Paya team, Kelly in the back, Mike in the back, Fabio in the back. Um, we we're like a very detail-oriented team, but one of our skills is we can be very detail-oriented and zoom out, and I thought, oh, we didn't make a plan for the stool. But I'm gonna leave it here on purpose because it feels very cool to be this tall. Uh, but also because I think events like these remind me that we are big, right? That we are big and we are mighty, and sometimes when you stand behind the podium and you read from your remarks, you, you, you're just kind of reading and you're in the zone, right? And you're like, I don't know, I'm not really paying attention, I'm not looking up, I don't really know what I'm saying anymore, I just like, I'm watching the time and I gotta get to the end. And sometimes this work can feel like that, right? I mean, those of us who are in it on a day-to-day, -day, you're constantly on the phone, you're in Zoom meetings, you're kind of, you're, you're almost like um, system code switching all day long. You're calling it soft, we had this conversation this week, you're calling it soft skills with your employer partners and then you get on the next call and it's 21st century skills and you're just, the, the translation can be exhausting from folks. So being here up on the stool with you all, hearing the stories of the apprentices, of the program builders, of the policy folks who are trying to get these systems to work on our behalf, and then the, the folks here um, who are our, Many of our core supporters, and we've got others in the room, Eve and Farhad, and I hope I'm not missing anybody, but I'm scanning. Um, we, we really do feel that this is a celebration of all that we've accomplished, and together we are mighty. And I think the most exciting thing about this work has been watching the community grow, and, and even as people get added, the sort of layers of partnerships remain intact. So we have a collaborative of funders that support the work. We have a collaborative of national partners who have put egos to the side to put together that definition to put together an agenda to share frameworks and opinions and views and kind of duke it out when we're trying to figure out like what is the way forward for this work but we also have in all of those communities on our map leaders like you all who are working with higher education institutions with k-12 institutions with employers with chambers of commerce with state education agencies with state workforce boards and really trying to make those partnerships work um, and I think the magnitude of the challenges that we've talked about today really require that. There are not many places you can go in the U.S. and find people who are coming together to solve problems, right? I mean, I think a unique feature of our world today is that people are m moving farther and farther apart and finding comfort and safety in doing that. This is an, uh, uh, youth apprenticeship is uniquely suited to bring people together to find solutions. And it remains a sort of a bipartisan solution, a solution that gets education people and employers on the same page 
and, and, it, and it gives us all a better stool to stand on as we're trying to think about what the way forward can be. So I am going to stand up here for about 30 more seconds and enjoy being six feet tall, which is something I've never been. Um, but I just wanted to express my gratitude to all of you who have made the trip. It's a really busy time. You are very busy people. You've got places to be. You've got problems to solve. Um, but we are bigger and better together. Uh, and we really appreciate your coming here today to share your work, to reflect on what's been hard, to celebrate the wins, to celebrate other people's wins, and to ask really good questions that we are going to take with us into phase three, find and hopefully uh, share solutions with all of you. Um, and we're really excited to have the opportunity to do that. Um, we know lots of you have been like, what does it mean? What does it mean you're launching? What's next? Where do we go from here? Um, but rest assured, we've got lots of stuff headed your way very, very soon. Um, we want to continue to grow this field. We want to continue to tell your stories. We want to continue to get be better data and understand more about what it takes to do this work well. And most of all, we want to be back here in two years, or maybe not even back here because I guess if we push the chairs together, we could get a few more people in. But if we're going to keep growing and growing and growing, we might end up uh, in a bigger ballroom soon. So thank you all for making the trip. Stay in touch. Stay in touch with each other. And keep up all the good work all over the place. Thanks so much. Thank